Madam Secretary, the streaming is live. Thank you, Carol Mathis. Good morning to you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to all those who are joining us this morning. Um, I am welcoming you to what I hope and believe will be our last virtual meeting. So um, I'm very, very excited to get back um, with everybody in person. I do believe that there is a different energy when we're able to do that. So with that, um, Vice Chair Allison DeTunk, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All righty, great, thank you. In light of the continuing state of emergency declared by Governor Northam, where it is impractical or unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location, I move that we adopt this agenda to take action to discuss or transact the business temporarily required or necessary to continue the operation of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Do I have a second? Second. Um, please indicate your uh, approval with the roll call. Mr. Dodson. Yay. Mr. Johnson. Yay. Mr. Kasperowitz. Aye. Mr. Malvin. Yes. Mr. Merrill. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. Dr. Smoot. Aye. Mr. Stinson. Mr. Williams. Mr. Yates. Aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Tunk. Yes. Ms. Hines. Yes. The rolls complete, the motions pass. Thank you. Um, with that, we're gonna turn to um, our 395-95 commuter choice presentation. Good morning, Jennifer. Good, good morning, Madam Secretary and members of the board. Um, I'm gonna kick off this morning's presentation and turn it over to my colleague, Ben Owen from NBTC. Um, we're here today to give you a briefing on uh, the second round of project recommendations out of the I-395-95 Commuter Choice Program. Next slide, please. So just a little background on Commuter Choice. Uh, Commuter Choice is a competitive grant program uh, that we're using toll revenues from both the I-66 and the I-395-95 corridors uh, to advance multimodal transportation projects that uh, maximize person throughput in those corridors and implement, uh, as I mentioned already, multimodal improvements. So very important programs in both of those corridors. Next slide, please. Uh, for this 395-95 corridor, all of the jurisdictions in NVTC, which are shown on the slide in green, and PRTC, which are shown on the slide in blue, are eligible for um, to apply for funding under the program along with the public transportation providers uh, in those jurisdictions. Next slide, please. And so I just wanna to touch on some of the key roles and responsibilities, starting with the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Uh, the CTB does hold uh, responsibility for approving the projects that are recommended for funding uh, under the Commuter Choice Program. Uh, VDOT receives the annual transit investment payments from Transurban, transfers them to us at DRPT, uh, where we provide uh, those payments to the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. We also review the projects uh, that are submitted um, as part of their application project process for eligibility. Uh, we also coordinate with the Office of the Attorney General to ensure that we're meeting uh, all of the legal tests related to utilization of toll revenues for uh, these projects. And then we make the final recommendation to the board uh, for, um, for projects to be approved for funding. NVTC manages the, um, the overall commuter choice program. Uh, they solicit the applications, they do the technical analysis um, that Ben will walk you through momentarily. Uh, they make the recommendation of the multimodal uh, improvements to be funded under the program. And once those projects progress, they monitor their effectiveness. Uh, they develop an annual report that comes to you each year, and they also market those transportation options in the corridor. 
and I touched on the applicants and uh, recipients in the previous slide, but they are the ones that apply for and carry out these very important transportation projects. And with that, um, we can go to the next slide and I'm gonna turn it over to Ben, who's gonna walk you through the rest of the presentation. Great, thank you, Jen. And good morning, Madam Secretary and members of the board. Nice to be good back morning. with you Good morning, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so just one more piece of overview before we get into the exciting stuff here, which is our, our technical evaluation process. So um, basically how we evaluate all the eligible proposals we receive. This process puts most of the possible points, it's a 100 point scale, into how well projects touch on those improvement goals that Jen mentioned for the corridor of efficiently moving more people and creating viable, effective transportation options that save time for commuters, connect different modes of transportation, as well as activity centers across the region, and absorb trips that might be priced off the expressway due to tolling. We have smaller categories for cost effectiveness, basically looking at the overall technical merit score relative to the funding request from the program, also considering the useful life of the project. That's 15 points. We have an applicant preference criterion where each applicant can pick their top priority project out of the applications they're submitting and receive 10 points for it. And then interagency collaboration where projects with documented support or collaboration from other entities in the region can get five points. So all folds into a 100 point scale, which you'll see in a second here. Next slide, please. So looking at the proposals we received for round two funding, we have pretty good um, coverage of the overall corridor all the way from Spotsylvania County up to the DC line. Our call for projects closed in January. We received 18 applications with a total funding request of $26.2 million. We determined that four were ineligible. Also two very similar proposals were consolidated, um, giving us the 13 applications you see here with the $21.9 million total funding request. Just to touch real quick um, on the uh, main ineligibility factor affecting three of the four proposals, um, the commissions adopted a definition of allowable transportation demand management projects last fall uh, that requires directly measurable outcomes in terms of the number of corridor commuters that are shifting from driving alone to using other means like transit, ride sharing, biking and walking. Um, and this, is, this has been kind of a challenge with TDM projects in the past. So, we have debriefed with the affected applicants and we'll work to ensure expectations are fully clear on the, de the new definition going forward. Among the three, um, the 13 applications that are eligible, we noted three general categories, um, each pretty compelling. Um, so each application falls into one of them. The first being enhancements to a total of three local Dash and Fairfax connector bus routes in the northern part of the corridor. Um, these enhancements would allow for service every 15 minutes or better throughout the day on weekdays um, to improve connections with Metro, jobs and services for commuters, kind of regardless of what time they're traveling. And we can support this type of improvement in this corridor since the tolling in the express lanes occurs at all times. The second general category is efforts to rebuild ridership post pandemic and prepare for expected future travel patterns. So here we have park and ride capacity expansions in Prince William and Spotsylvania counties financial incentives to rebuild vanpool ridership in the corridor, and the new Virginia Railway Express feeder bus service in the Fredericksburg area. And the third category, continuations of a total of six new and enhanced Omni-Ride and Fairfax Connector bus services that we've funded in round one and that are operational right now to provide predictability and continuity for commuters as they return to work sites. Overall, these 13 proposals would move about 1,000 more people each morning inbound um, in the corridor upon full implementation and as travel patterns in the corridor revert to more typical conditions. And we did work with um, applicants to ensure reasonable figures given continued impacts of COVID-19 on travel behavior in the region. Um, we are expecting full funding of about $30 million over the two fiscal years of the program in terms of those annual transit investment payments from Transurban. So all the proposals could fit within the available funding. Next slide, please. A lot of the focus in this round was transit service. Many of the new and enhanced bus service proposals include capital expenses, like bus purchases and park and ride and bus stop improvements. One thing we are going to need to watch for future rounds of funding is the overall share of program funding going to transit operations. Um, the MOA that we have uh, between the commissions and the Commonwealth limits our support for transit operations to 50% of overall funding over any five year period. So looking at what we funded in round one and the proposals we have in round two, we'd be very close to that figure, but still within it. 
Next slide, please. So here you see the, the top level scoring results um, on that uh, set of criteria that I walked through a minute ago. Um, bit of a range here. We think these are all worthwhile proposals, however. A couple remarks on the results. Um, part of why you see the range that you do is a couple of our factors, uh, person throughput and cost effectiveness are basically graded on a curve. So you have relatively similar numbers of proposals with um, high, medium, and low scores on those. And a factor that lowered scores kind of across the board this time was travel time savings. Um, we compare a typical trip using each proposed project, in most cases with a drive alone trip not paying a toll. Uh, during our application period, drive times were low simply because fewer people were commuting during peak periods. But we do expect projects will deliver travel time benefits as traffic picks back up. Next slide, please. So the, the staff recommendation, and this was agreed to by the Joint Commission Working Group at their meeting last month, that's basically a subcommittee of NBTC and PRTC with three commissioners apiece, uh, kind of specific to this corridor, is to fund all 13 eligible proposals, given that all of them support the corridor improvement goals and can fit within the funding expected to be available. <laughs> this will be subject to the public comment re received. We also briefed the full commissions on this recommendation earlier this month, no questions or concerns about it. Um, administrative costs for us for the two year period, $800,000 total would be included. That would represent about three and a half percent of the overall funding that would be awarded if the staff recommendation is adopted. And we would hold any leftover funds for the next funding round. We do expect stronger demand at that time as post pandemic travel patterns become clearer across the region. Next slide, please. Before I talk about next steps and wrap up, I'll touch briefly on our public comment period. Uh, this just closed yesterday. Uh, it opened, it was open for about a month. It was fully online. We promoted it through our social media channels as well as targeted online advertising. Many of our applicants also helped us spread the word about it. We held an interactive virtual town hall meeting late last month over YouTube in lieu of an in-person hearing for members of the public to learn more about the proposed projects and the overall program. And we received 40 responses, um, overall supportive either for the program in general or for specific projects. Next slide, please. So in terms of what else is coming up following today's meeting, um, we anticipate adoption of a program of projects by the commissions early next month that they will refer to you for consideration and action at your meeting in late June. Uh, we would then begin executing agreements for selected projects so that they could begin implementation with the start of the new fiscal year. And then we have, of course, ongoing implementation and performance monitoring responsibilities for those projects. Next slide, please. So with that, I will conclude and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Ben. Um, Mary Hines, is there anything you would like to add to the discussion, you or Mr. Kaspowitz? Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Ben, great, great job. Um, these are all worthy things to do. Um, good use of our transit payments um, from Transurban. And, you know, since we don't know what the future is going to bring, I think having more service out there available to people as they begin to make those choices is actually a really good idea and potentially will help people come back uh, to transit. So I commend this to my colleagues. Madam Chair. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Hey, I would echo Mary's comments. Uh, it's a really good uh, slate of projects. And um, as we anticipated when, when this was being formulated, uh, we continue to make improvements that add to the overall efficiency of the quarter. So I, I think it's a program that's working extremely well and um, just adds to the flexibility and the capacity in the quarter year by year. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Madam Secretary, I had two questions. Good morning, morning Mr. Merrill. Good morning. How are you today? I am well. Good. Yeah, first question was um, the recommendations were 31 and 21 million. And it said the funding was 30, so I was not sure about that one. And then secondarily, could, could I get a little an explanation on the dash? It has, you know, the biggest one was a $5.7 million bus service from the Metro to the Pentagon. And I thought we had Metro serving the Pentagon. I was just curious about that. Sure. Um, so in terms of the, the funding request and the funding available, um, the $30 million comes from the 
payout schedule that's part of Transurban's master agreement to operate the express lanes, the 95 and 395 express lanes. So we would anticipate, you know, we received their last payment in full um, late last year, early this year, despite, you know, the kind of downturn in traffic um, given COVID and such. So they've been a very strong partner in this, and we have reason to believe that we'll receive the full $30 million expected over the two-year period. Um, the 21.9 reflects the total funding request among the 13 eligible proposals under consideration. So, you know, I think demand probably was a little bit lower this time around, in part because this is a kind of commute-focused program. And just, you know, I think um, a lot of what we've supported historically has been commuter bus services and the demand for those, for expanding those is kind of, you know, soft at the moment until we sort of see what happens post-pandemic. Um, in terms of the, the DASH um, Van Dorn to Pentagon proposal, um, that would be kind of coming up from the west end of Alexandria, serving a number of areas. There's, there's some fairly high density development there along um, I-395, Southern Towers and other um, residential areas. That route would also pass by the Mark Center, go up to the Pentagon from there. So it is a pretty substantial service improvement that we would be supporting basically to um, 10 minute service throughout the day there on weekdays and 15 minutes on weekends, um, as well as some capital improvements at, at bus stops along the route. And on the Metro line is what you're saying. Right, so this this is sort of connecting two different pieces of Metro, but serving a number of areas kind of between between stations that don't really have Metro service right okay. now. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anybody Madam else? Chair. Madam Secretary, Chef Miller, good morning. Good morning. Hope you're well. I am. I'm just so happy to be here. Can't wait for next month, actually. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, ben, a couple questions. Sure. Um, you talked about the revised definition that required um, vehicles to come off the road. Is that a, do you do that prospectively so that you capture um, people who are not doing any commuting now because they don't have an option? And two, how about growth as new people move in and, and take advantage of this service, but never had a car on the road that they're, that they're replacing? Do we, do we capture those two groups in our, in our numbers? Yeah, so the, the first part is kind of, in terms of looking at people, we're kind of looking at basically total total morning peak inbound travel flows using a project. So kind of however the ridership for that would be developed. Um, so for transit services, it's possible there are, you know, some trips that are factored in there that maybe are transit dependent trips, um, you know, people that are not driving, but a lot of what we've supported has been, you know, there is a real focus on benefiting the toll payers and making sure we're creating transportation options that are appealing to people that, you know, have a choice as well. Um, we do anticipate, you know, when we're looking at our, our throughput figures, that is for the opening year of the project, um, we do anticipate a number of things we're supporting will have longer term benefits beyond that too. Um, particularly the capital projects, you know, which we want to try to encourage more of in the future as well. Um, and, you know, that there, there will be growth. And for transit services, we basically support two years at a time. And then, you know, if, if the recipient wants to continue service with our funding, they come back and apply again. So, you know, there's a chance to sort of see in that process, you know, how is ridership performing over time? And, and a lot of things we've supported have grown um, and been expanded you know, in more than one round of funding, obviously COVID has kind of taken a whack off things in the last year or so. Um, so do we, and second question, do we look at all these projects in the rear view mirror and see if they met the goals? Yes, so we are doing that now. Um, our annual reports to you are basically looking at, um, you know, what was the target throughput for the project and what is it actually achieving? Perfect. Thank so you. each each year going forward, we're going to be continuing to report on that to you. Thank Madam, you. Anybody else? Madam Chair. Oh, Mr. Smooth. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I noticed that none of these projects involve either Virginia or directly involve either Virginia Railway Express or Metro. Uh, is that generally excluded or it just happened to be the case in this round? 
kind of happened to be the case in this round. We did have um, a number of conversations with Virginia Railway Express about kind of how they could fit something in with this program. I think just given given the kind of shifting pieces that they were working with um, earlier this year, they decided not to apply this time around, but they may come back in future rounds, either in the 395 or 66 corridor. And, you know, we're, we're very, we definitely encourage them to look for ways to potentially fit our program in, and we'd like to continue to engage with them about that. Um, we have seen some metro related projects more in the I-66 corridor in terms of Metro bus services, service enhancements that jurisdictions have applied for. Um, there was one proposal last time to help construct a second entrance at the Boston station that Arlington County proposed. Of course, our, our I-66 program was really hit by COVID and toll revenue decreases there, but that's when we expect to come back in the future. So I'd say a lot of the Metro proposals tend to be kind of jurisdiction led. Um, in terms of capital and operating improvements. Thank you. Sure. Madam Secretary. Yes. A quick question to follow, really follow up on um, Shep's question regarding evaluation of the funded programs. I noted in the updated MOU, which is on the agenda for the board meeting, um, that beginning in 2020, I believe, um, an evaluation of those funded programs would be provided was did did we can you point me to that document if if it's been provided I've missed I've missed it so if you could just point me in the direction of where I could locate it that would be helpful yes Thank i you. can provide a link to that if that would be helpful whatever the best means is to to do that that would be great thank you okay sure Jenda Brull, um perhaps the link could go through carol to the board Yes, Madam Secretary will take care of that. And we did include a mention of that um, annual report when we briefed the board on the I-66 commuter choice program last fall. So we, it does come back. It, it usually is tied in with another presentation, but we'll make sure we get you that link as well. Thank you. All right. Well, um, with that, thank you, Jennifer DeBrule and Ben Owen. We appreciate that update. Um, with them, Margie Ray. Good morning, Madam Secretary, members of the board. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. It is a beautiful day out. <laughs> um, I too look forward to being in person. <laughs> Um, so I'm here today to talk about our uh, safety performance management program. This is an annual requirement. Uh, we last spoke about it last May and June. So just giving you all an update um, and presentation of new information. So next slide, please. So the first few slides just go through some background and kind of a refresher of where we are with the safety program while we're doing these things. And so between MAP 21 and the FAST Act, there is a federal law that requires us to establish performance targets for five um, safety measures. We have to do it annually. And then we also have to agree to targets for three of those five performance measures between VDOT and the Governor's Highway Safety Office. So that's ma managed by DMV. Um, the timing of this meeting is always important to us because DMV has to report their targets to NHTSA, the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, by the end of June. And then VDOT reports its targets to the Federal Highway Administration by the end of August. Uh, one thing that we brought to you all last year was this last bullet here is that annually, beginning last year, FHWA makes an annual determination of significant progress. So they look nationally at all the states to see how they are doing relative to those targets that were established. Next slide, please. So these are the five measures that we are responsible for. Um, again, things that you all should be pretty familiar with as far as those numbers of fatalities and serious injuries, but also looking at the rates per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. And then uh, the last measure, or well, the first three are the ones that we have to work with DMV to agree to the targets. And then the last one, they combine both the fatalities and serious injuries when we look at our non-motorized um, crashes. Next slide. And again, some additional background. Um, when we first started setting targets uh, per the federal requirements beginning in 2018 and or for 2018 and 2019, we utilized at that time, it was a, basically a five-year rolling average and it was the 
uh, methodology that was prescribed by both FHWA and NHTSA and really was just reliant on um, past history with crashes and the outcomes. And uh, back when we first started talking to you all about this, you really directed us to identify a data-driven methodology to establish those targets. Let's make sure that we're really looking at this thoughtfully. We're looking at our investment strategies. We're combining these things such that we can better understand and influence our crash outcomes. Um, with that and uh, a couple of years of uh, going through our uh, data-driven process, um, we were able to demonstrate some real safety benefits through certain investment strategies, particularly the um, systemic safety improvements. And so you all adopted a policy uh, back in 2019 that um, helps us to um, prioritize our funding towards those safety systemic safety improvements um, to help improve those safety outcomes. You know, and then really uh, over the last couple of years, we've really had some strong um, support from the, this administration and we saw a lot of change in 2020 with the governor's um, omnibus package that um, both uh, created a highway safety improvement fund um, to improve both the behavioral and infrastructure spending for highway safety. We also had um, you know, the emphasis or the uh, passage of the handheld ban, which didn't go into effect though until January 1 of this year. Uh, we also had um, photo enforcement for uh, work zones and school zones. So we've had several key changes to help improve those safety outcomes through time. Next slide, please. So how are we doing? Um, so this gives us our trends all the way back to 2006 through this past year in 2020. And this is all the data that's reported through FARS, which is the federal system that uh, DMV uh, uses and, and reports through. And we can see that um, our serious injuries, just starting with that one, because that's a really positive one there, as far as really seeing a downward uh, trend with that. We were seeing that before 2020, so that was all very positive. Uh, same thing a bit with our serious injury, I'm sorry, our um, non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. And generally a flat line, and then this last year we saw a decline. Um, the fatalities have always been uh, the challenging one for us um, in that we were seeing a lot of trends that showed that we were likely to see some increases um, to everybody's dismay. Um, we do see that uh, we finished 2020 on a high, which was uh, clearly not a good place to be. Um, one quick sidebar to this slide is um, you see the legend uh, and it says F plus SI down in the bottom left. That's fatalities plus serious injuries. Every once in a while, we abbreviate just for uh, space. So fatalities plus serious injuries. Next slide, please. Um, just skipping backward a little bit in time to this uh, determination of significant progress that FHWA does. It's kind of always a bit in arrears. Uh, last year, we reported out to you for the first time on how we did. And actually, for our 2018 targets, we did not make significant progress. But the, 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 um, how they're making this determination is that at least four of the five targets have to be met or we have to be better than our original baseline values. Um, when we didn't meet it last year, we were, we were required to submit an implementation plan and that was done. Uh, we already ob obligate 100% of our uh, HSM funds, so we were already doing that. But based on this year for, or for the newest determination based on the 2019 targets, uh, Virginia did make some significant progress and the next slide has the data. And so we can see uh, in green highlights that we where we did achieve um, either the target or we achieved the baseline. Uh, the only one where we didn't uh, get there was on our rate of fatalities. Next slide. So now kind of looking forward in how we predict our targets. So this is just uh, the methodology that we use. It's three key steps that we look at. So on an annual basis, we're looking at the statistical model that we've developed and we're adding combinations of um, external factors and looking at those factors that seem to have the greatest influence on our safety outcomes. So we assess those factors and the traffic impacts. Then we update and find that and we set our um, use that as our baseline prediction for our future targets. So in this case, our 2022 targets. Um, with the model development, there's a, a lag between when we have data available versus when we're going to have those um, targets uh, for 2022. And so what we've done is we look at the anticipated benefits of the projects that are included in the six year improvement program. They're either underway or soon to be completed projects that could help influence and help drive down those numbers not yet accounted for in the baseline data. So we look at those infrastructure projects. 
Um, then we combine those those data to come up with our those two sets and come up with those new data driven targets. Next slide. So when we look at doing developing the model again, several key steps here that just go into the model development. Um, mentioned already that we're assessing those um, past and new external factors, really looking at the combinations that make the most sense. Uh, we also have an annual factor that we use to calibrate the model each year. We typically validate it against the most recently completed year so that we see how well our model is predicting. And then with the forecasting those external and um, annual factors, we get to that target year prediction. And so just kind of overall how we develop the model. Um, next slide. So these are the uh, factors, um, many of which have been utilized in our, our last three years or two years of the modeling. Um, so we can see that uh, the ones that are highlighted in blue with those arrows are new factors that have um, impact on our models. We do have three different models for the fatality, serious injuries, and the non-motorized crashes. And so um, what we can see is that some um, drop in and out, depending on how statistically significant they are. Um, we've um, had this conversation before that we know that VMT growth tends to have some of the highest and greatest impact, um, greatest correlation with our model output. So, but we also, um, you know, when we look at these factors, we did want to understand infrastructure spending. Um, so in, we see it both on the behavioral spending programs that they have a positive influence in helping to reduce crashes and serious injuries or just overall crashes. Uh, we see things like our maintenance spending, especially like on our, our pavement program or bridge maintenance programs that also have a positive impact on our crash outcomes. Um, you know, we look, we've looked at a lot of other things like um, unemployment rates. Uh, we've tried to look at you know, age of vehicles, things like that. Some of this is still that we don't have the data or we're trying to accumulate the data and we'll continue on an annual basis to reevaluate those factors that um, we think have potential influences in um, our predictions, our abilities to predict. Next slide. So in developing the model for this year, um, you know, we really had a lot of challenges. Um, as you can well imagine that uh, 2020 was not a normal year for us. And so Stephen Reed and uh, the team in the highway um, in VDOT's traffic engineering division ran multiple scenarios. Uh, we really looked at, you know, a high VMT growth, a low VMT growth. Uh, we looked at uh, what happens when we use our um, calibration factors and other factors to help manage that. Um, you know, we even looked at one point of let's remove the months that we had really low VMT growth. If you'll recall, you've been receiving uh, regular updates from Mina Lockwood from Traffic Engineering Division on the data and seeing those trends that uh, and the recovery that we were seeing. And so um, where we landed um, after really looking at multiple scenarios and the output from that, as far as what seemed to make most sense um, and, and you know, really kind of that was the driving factors. What makes sense to us? What seems the most realistic um, way to move forward with this is we really went back to the end of 2019 and we made the assumption of what was happening in 2019 is what's going to continue moving forward. Um, if we started with 2020 data, it really uh, uh, skewed us low. And we didn't feel like that was where we were really going to be. And so really looking at that 2019 data as we're going to assume that by 2022, things will have recovered sufficiently. Um, our VMT growth, uh, typically we use a five-year average. Uh, when we looked back over the last five years, much of that growth was in the early years. And so for the last, for 2017 through 2019, we really saw a reduced growth, still growth, but lower, and um, went with that lower growth for the model. Um, so we also uh, typically would validate using the 2020 data. We did not validate with that data. So we really had to make some assumptions this year to uh, deal with this. Um, this is a national challenge. Um, and also, uh, you know, I've presented to you all before um, other performance measures with our system performance, like reliability and congestion measures. And same thing there, we're really uh, going to be challenged in trying to ha handle and understand how to use data from 2020. So for this purpose, we did exclude the 2020 data. Next slide, please. And here are just the charts that we typically share with you all that uh, uh, provide uh, both our projected and our actual. So the blue is the observed values that we've had. The orange line is our predicted values. 
Um, and then the dashed lines above and below are just kind of our confidence intervals around each of the model scenarios and the model runs. And so you can see the gap for 2020. And then when you get off to the far right with our projections for 2022, you can see the, the bolded numbers. That's our baseline prediction for our fatalities, serious injuries, and our non-motorized fatal, fatal and serious injuries. So um, just kind of how the chart is laid out and the predictions that we've um, used moving forward for the rest of this presentation. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned that we then start looking at the expected benefits of our programmed projects. There's three categories I'll talk about right here and all the slides are laid out similarly. So the first one is slot spot and corridor projects then hybrid projects and then systemic improvements. So this year we reviewed 130 smart scale projects and highway safety improvement program projects that are going to be constructed, you know, they finish construction or will be completed between January 2020 and, and early in 2022. And again, this is uh, projects that the data that would be the outcome of these projects isn't yet, yet captured in the data for the model predictions. Um, so our total investment here was over a billion dollars. Um, when we analyze these projects, we also look at using methodology that is similar to how we calculate the benefits for the smart scale process. Um, this is a sub significant increase over what we had last year. I think last year it was um, around 80 projects and about 400 million. So we um, definitely have increased that investment. Uh, next slide. So when we, this chart here, so the first row is what we've seen in the crash history for the last five years. Um, and then based on the assumptions that we make with the model and trying to estimate the benefits, and that's based on the type of project, the types of crashes, we uh, really look at the, it's a standardized methodology that we look at to say, what would be the estimated benefit of a project once constructed? And understanding that those benefits then accrue through time, because once you built it, it's there and it continues to serve that, that same purpose. So that second row gets to what would our expected number of fatalities be after construction is completed? And while it's still high, we can see that there's a significant reduction there. And we also annualize it so that we look at on an annual basis, you know, what is that crash reduction? What percent did we see from these types of projects? And then we can also kind of annualize that cost to show the cost per reduction. And so we can see that for a spot in our hybrid type project, I'm sorry, our corridor type project that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's up there, but that depends on the types of projects and the investments that we're making for that. But total investment cost for this package of projects was 1.07 billion. Next slide. So these are um, hybrid projects on uh, our very first round of um, model setting. We included these with the spot and corridor projects and felt like it was worthwhile to separate these out. These are lower cost or mid cost improvements um, like widening the paved shoulders um, and adding rumble strips, uh, guardrail, maybe that's corridor traffic signal projects. So these tend to range um, a little bit more like 300 to $500,000 per mile. Um, an example that I provided in the past was uh, Route 460 shoulder widening and rumble strips. It was about 7.3 miles for $3 million. So pretty cost effective solutions, fairly well distributed as well. So we can see that for the same time period, we had 15 projects. Um, again, uh, the crash data that's provided in the chart is the last five years of data. Next slide. So our you, uh, same thing, row one is the crash totals that were observed the expected um, crashes after completion based on the types of improvements that were being done. Uh, we can see that there's a, a pretty good reduction of those uh, crashes and the rate of crashes per year has uh, improved. And then when we look at the annualized cost, that, that's a pretty uh, good cost benefit ratio essentially um, for $41 million. Next slide. So these are our systemic highway safety improvement pro projects. And so these are low cost. They're systemically distributed over a network. Um, typically, we can get a lot of coverage for a much lower cost. Um, 55 projects that we were looked at. And one thing too to highlight here is that based off the policy that you all adopted in December of 2019, um, this package of projects here for systemic treatments does reflect the beginning of the implementation of that program. So 48 of the 50 projects worth about 92% of the 70 million here um, are targeting those systemic treatments that are included in that implementation plan. 
And some of those were already programmed before we kicked off the plan, but certainly some has been well underway at this point. Um, these are things like our flashing yellow arrows, our high visibility back plates, um, chevrons, um, and things like that around the curves. Um, we do have pavement rumble strips that are being installed, but that's part of our maintenance program. So as they do uh, pavement overlays and pavement improvements, they will be adding in rumble strips. So again, uh, pretty cost effective solution for um, the types of crashes and injuries. Next slide. So same slide here, as far as our crash totals, what we would expect after these are implemented. Um, our reductions are pretty substantial here um, with about a 12% reduction. And then our annualized cost is 11.9 million for a total investment of 70.1 million. So again, and I'm highlighting the fatalities column, but clearly we see these benefits across all, and I should have said that on the first slide here. So we see benefits across all of the uh, crash types that we're looking at when we implement these projects. Next slide. This is just a summary of all of that so that you can kind of compare your spot hybrid and systemic uh, reductions um, across our fatality serious injuries. And again, bike ped um, fatalities plus serious injury crashes. And we can see that um, uh, for this, the expected reductions in that lower column that we would expect about 9.5 fatalities on an annual basis. Um, pretty substantial here as far as the number of serious injuries at 102 per year and our bike pet at about 13.4 per year. Next slide. So what we have here then is where we comp combine both our uh, baseline model predictions along with those expected project reductions that I just highlighted. And so across the top, top um, row, 881, 71, 17, 659, those all came from the charts that I shared a few slides back. And then the step two expected annual reductions were on the prior slide. Uh, the third row there is the expected reductions from the handheld ban. And we actually included this in our slide deck last year in our target setting. Um, since it only went into effect July 1, I'm sorry, January 1, we don't necessarily have the data to support it in the model development at this point. And so we wanted to um, highlight and subtract that out as a, a specific line item. This is data that was provided by DMV. Um, there was some research that was done and DMV was able to provide us some estimates of the expected reductions. And um, generally what we've had was a range and we went with the lower end of the range for those reductions to be a little bit conservative in our estimates here. So we do have this expectation of um, increased reductions as a result of the handheld ban. And um, hopefully next year when we look at our targets, we'll be able to start understanding that better within the, the model and just in our target setting practices. So step three, the last row there is just how we combine the models. So basically taking that baseline and subtracting out um, our expected benefits from the others. Um, the bottom two rows are just the comparison of what you all have adopted in our prior, um, in the last two years for our targets uh, based off of our model predictions. All right, next slide, please. So I'm looking for feedback today on the targets, um, any questions that you all may have. And then what we anticipate is that next month bringing to you all um, a resolution for adoption of the targets such that we, um, especially the DMV and the Highway Safety Office can uh, submit their targets per the NHTSA requirements. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to field any questions. Madam Honestly, Secretary, this is before great. I, before I turn it over, I will just say this one statement. Well, I have two. One, Margie and her team do an excellent job. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, gathering data, analyzing data, and really putting forward, um, you know, a, a wonderful uh, path for all of us. Um, I will say this is not where we want to be. I know we're heading in the right direction right now, um, but certainly it's challenging to accept goals when you can look across the board at uh, the fatalities and the injuries. So. I say that, and um, with that, I, sa I said to the team the other day, it's going to take a lot, you know, a lot of effort to get to zero. And uh, so anyway, I know how much uh, effort and really dedication the board has put into safety. The omnibus bill really substantially increased the amount of investment we're putting in safety. We're taking this very seriously. 
um, and just felt that the numbers needed some context. With that, I will open it up to the board. Madam Secretary, this is Greg. Good morning again. Good morning again. Margie, I have a couple questions for you, just some uh, percentages. I'm just curious uh, what the ratio of pedestrian fatalities is to uh, vehicular fatalities, and if that's risen or, or, or gone down. And secondly, again, um, just want to emphasize, I just, I'd like to know the percentage of fatalities that, uh, vehicular fatalities that, uh, where people don't have seat belts, uh, and you know if that's if that's risen or gone down, and and possibly if we can implement a another program or some uh, way to to emphasize that to the public. Thank you, um, Mr. Yates. Thank you very much. Those are great questions. Um, I'll be honest; I probably don't have the percentages that you need, but we certainly can provide that. Um, we um, have all the data from 2020, and um, I'm. Well, I'm sure we'll be releasing that soon as far as just kind of recapping everything. Um, in 2020, uh, the pedestrian fatalities actually went down a little bit. Um, I think that has probably more to do probably with the reduction in BMTs. Um, I'd probably let uh, our safety folks speak a little bit more to that. Uh, as far as your second um, one with the percentage of the fatalities and the seatbelts, I do know that is still the um, a very significant area of concern for us. As far as when we look at um, 2020 and the number of fatalities that occurred as um, unrestrained fatalities. Um, I, again, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but we can provide those. Um, I'm going to just pause for a second. Um, Marshall Herman, are you on this call? Yes, Madam Secretary. Okay, could you provide the information to Mr. Yates? I definitely can on the unrestrained fatalities. Um, and. 2020 uh, unrestrained fatalities went up just over 12%. Um, pedestrian uh, fatalities actually went down 8% comparing 2020 and 2019 data. Okay. I, I then, think the percentages with the, the seat belts um, is important because the, the volume of traffic was down and those fatalities went up for those who were unrestrained. So. Right. Um, and right. I think Marshall's speed also was a huge factor. Speed, speed was a big factor in 2020. Uh, the fatalities that were speed related went up over 16%. Um, so to, to address something, uh, I think your additional question, Mr. Yates, uh, you had asked if there was anything additional that we could do uh, with the governor's executive leadership team on highway safety. April was highway safety month, and we did focus on um, on, a, on wearing safety belts uh, during Highway Safety Month. We can always recheck of where we are at the halfway point in 2021 to see um to see what concerning trends are coming up in the first six months of the year okay marshall one one other thing is uh, how do we compare on seatbelt uh, enforcement and fatalities and that kind of thing with, with other states i mean i just wonder if other people are doing a much better job what are they doing differently than virginia and where are we are we in the middle are we at the bottom or, or where where are we in that I can't speak to the enforcement directly, but I can uh, work with our friends in public safety and homeland security to get that information for you. Um, looking at what Virginia's numbers are, and then um, and then I can do some research on the other states too. Yeah, I just love to know if, if we're in the bottom third. You know, what what are the states that are doing so much better than this? What are they doing differently? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just need to see what those other states are are doing because I guarantee you we're not in the uh, the top half of the of percentages on uh, non seat belts. I'd, I'd really like to see that maybe the board would too. I will definitely um, look into that and, and bring some information back to you. Happy Thank to look you. into it. Well, hey, Marshall. Marshall, this is uh, John Malvin. I um, I was just, just curious, I, I, if I remember correctly, the DMV is, is uh, takes the charge of doing whatever outreach programs we do to 
uh, improve our, our seat belt numbers. And to be honest with you, I, I haven't seen anything, any effective communications or programs, uh, and maybe it's going on and just doesn't come in my space, but uh, I remember the old click it, tick, click it or ticket program, and that was highly visible. I'm not sure to what effect it had, but I, I'm with Greg. I, I'm not, you know, this is such a big area of a big problem. I'm not sure that we're um, attacking it aggressive enough. Just my this my observations and thoughts. Madam Secretary, this is Shep. Okay, I'm back. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know if Carol told you, but I got kicked out of the meeting. So anyway, I'm back. Yes, yes, Mr. Miller. Thank you, ma'am. Um, similarly to what to what Mr. Malvin said, Mr. Yates said, you know, th this program is primarily focused on infrastructure, right? So we do this analysis and we say, okay, what can we do with infrastructure spend? Um, by changing infrastructure to make it more safe. And obviously that's a that's a critical piece because if we got something that's unsafe, we ought to try to fix it or less safe, I should say. Um, do we do a matrix? It sounds like we sort of do that each crash with a fatality or serious injury would be analyzed in a matrix and you'd have, was it impaired driving? Was it speed? Was the seat belt on? Da 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 as opposed to um, some of the things we measure in this in this predictive index, like age and and alcohol sales, and you know, really getting down to what's causing the crash or what's contributing the crash, um, mechanical failure, et cetera, and let that also guide sort of how we attack this problem, sort of to Mr. Malbin's point on seat belts or whatever. You know, some of it's mechanical failure, some of it's speeding and aggressive driving, some of it is uh, safety issues on the highway itself, some of it is da 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 da. Do we do that? And how does that track against, um, for example, what I'm saying is if if 80% of the of the of the fatalities and serious injuries had nothing to do with infrastructure, right? They had to do with impaired driving, mechanical failure. Um, aggressive driving, whatever it might be, then that would guide us to spend more focus and attention in that area. So do we have that kind of data? What does it tell us? And, um, and, and are, we, are we attacking it to, the, to, their, to, to, to John's and Greg's point? Are we attacking really part of the real problem? Madam Secretary. Um, yes, I will, I will just add before I turn it over to you, Commissioner, that um, DMV does track um, many of the factors that you all are raising today. And Commissioner, I think it may be good to, to have George Bennett come and give that presentation um, on where we are. Part of the issue for 2020 was that it was such an anomaly um, that uh, Anyway, that some of the, the the data was skewed. So I will just say that. So with um, Commissioner, I'll turn it over to you. Madam Secretary, members of the board, in response to Mr. Miller's question directly about our analyses concerning the causational factors associated with crashes occurring on our interstate or on our uh, <laughs> roadways here in, in, in the Commonwealth, the, the short answer is yes. We look at the multitude of uh, interactions that a crash may have. And, uh, and uh, it, it would be probably worth, as the Secretary has indicated, bringing not only George Bishop back from the Department of Motor Vehicles and, and looking at what has transpired over the last year crash-wise, but also having Mark Cole out of our uh, Traffic Engineering Division, who's responsible for the Strategic Highway Safety Plan development, at least from the department side, really re maybe re enlighten the board about our intersection plan and our roadway departure plans. And really, if you recall that the, the greatest crash uh, of statistics that we had on for roadway departure also had a contributing factor that they were that speed was a factor. Uh, they were unbelted. 
and then to a lesser degree, they they were intoxicated in some way, shape, or form. So it, it, we do look at the intersections that they do bring together, so that we can have a comprehensive approach, not only on the intersection or on the infrastructure side of the house, but also the behavioral component, the educational component, and then the uh, enforcement component that's there. So. I, I think, Madam Secretary, what I, if you would be willing for this, for the July meeting, bring back uh, just what those intersections look like, the matrices that uh, Mr. Miller has identified that we do put together and, and put those back up onto a screen. Um, Mr. Miller, if you recall some of that, uh, some of those efforts that the board took uh, policy on with regard to the Highway Safety Improvement Program to advance the uh, systemic projects that we had, you know, we've taken a hiatus on the spot improvements. And that's been because we recognize for intersections, there's a suite of projects that we can have the most benefit on. And for roadway departure, we were really looking at uh, rumble strips and centerline rumble strips and keeping people on the roadway. And if we can keep them on the roadway infrastructurally, even if they are speeding, even if they are intoxicated, we can keep them at least safe within the infrastructure. But then there's the other component that we still need to work on is the behavioral and, and the uh, 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 education and the enforcement components too. So that was a lot of words this morning, but, uh, and I see a thumbs up that I think I answered that question. So we'll bring that back in, in, July, in June. And, you know, commissioner, I also think that, you know, the governor's, um, uh, leadership, Highway Leadership um, Office also can contribute to this as well. Right now, it's housed in three different sections. Um, we bring it together, but I think it really would be good for the board to see it. And I, again, say 2020 was an interesting year for all of us in looking at this data. Hey, Madam hey, Secretary, Secretary. I, I have just one more comment on this. If my memory serves me correct, um, the, uh, the, the percentage of unbelted fatalities varies around the state. And again, I think Southwest Virginia may have a higher rate for whatever reason. Um, and I, I, I'm just making the comment that I know that they've done some things, but I really don't think we're aggressive enough, um, in this particular problem to, to move the needle more than than it has been in the past. So I won't I'm done talking about this. Thank you. Well, you know, I um I will say that what we were able to get through and all and I'm not saying that legislation is the answer. There are many different ways to approach this. Um in the when we introduced the omnibus bill, there were a number of um, safety initiatives that we put in there, including um, uh, just the uh, handheld um, ban on cell phones, which passed through another legislation, but it did take more than a, a year to get all of that through. Um, and I'm anxious to see if that's going to make a difference. But many of the other initiatives did not pass. Um, the open container law did not pass. The um, making seatbelts um, a primary offense did not pass. There were a number of um, efforts that did not pass legislatively. Uh, whether or not that happens, um, you know, is up for debate. It may be for good reason. I will just say that, you know, we just have to find ways to try to break through. So I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Ms. Hines, did you Secretary? want to something? Mm -hmm. no, it's Mary, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, um, I was hoping maybe Margie could talk a little bit about, um, because this is highway safety. So, could she talk a little bit about that? I hate to say typical, but, but where are the bike and ped people being hurt and dying in this highway safety program? When I look at the external factors that they look at, there's, we're not monitoring anything about about that kind of maintenance or that kind of system improvement. Um, and it may just be that this is the wrong program, but I that would be helpful to me. I know it's a smaller number of people, but nonetheless, um, 
I would those people are at much higher risk uh, with their in their interactions with cars than people in other cars are. So, so, uh, be, Madam Secretary, if I might uh, respond for Margie for uh, Miss Hines's response, we do look at the vulnerable road users, including the bicycle and pedestrian uh, component. And if you recall, I, I raised the point about Virginia's. Uh, uh, highway or the strategic highway safety plan that we have that was dated from 2017 through 2021 this year it's due for an update and one of our emphasis areas is uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety so I, we can certainly send you a link I've got it on my coffee table here in the office so uh, I, I we they are an integral component of our highway safety improvement program uh, the the outreach with Department of Motor Vehicles uh, and, and enforcement, so on the education, it it really is the four E approach. And it, and again, I'd look for us to bring this back up. I do have a meeting with Mark Cole later this afternoon, uh, particularly on a presentation that we were going to make today. We put that back to the June, so this is a very timely conversation to be able to craft what that message is coming back to the the June meeting. I'll be happy to wait. Thank you. And Madam Secretary, may I just add from a target setting perspective how we're um, addressing yeah. some of the um, science concerns? So um, we do, we within the model prediction itself, the spending is just captured broadly. It is by district um, and by month. It doesn't necessarily uh, provide spending that it would be directed towards um, bike or ped. Uh, infrastructure. However, we do account for it as well, though, in our projects, when we look at the various improvements that are being done, a lot of those might be uh, bicycle and pedestrian type projects. And so we account for it that way. And then with the systemic safety program that's being implemented, much of that is targeting um, things that will improve uh, pedestrian safety programs. Um, and to the commissioner's point, there are um, a lot of other strategies. Uh, the traffic engineering division, Mark Cole's team, they've got a um, you know, pedestrian safety action plan that is utilized to help identify areas that need to be improved. So again, we're common accounting for it a bit more from the perspective of the actual projects that are being implemented um, within the model. It would be become part of the data that's available. Madam Secretary, else? I had a question, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and unfortunately, I got disconnected for a couple minutes. So this is answered. I did too. Oh, good. Um, in looking at the, the models, um, thanks for the presentation, Ms. Ray. I was struck by the return on investment of the hybrid projects versus the other ones. I mean, for a significantly lower investment, there is a materially market improvement in fatality rates. So my question is, if we put more money into the hybrid projects, would that produce a bigger return in terms of safety improvements? If I'm looking at this correctly, I mean, I saw a 29% reduction in fatalities, and I think you summarized it on slide 19, and the investment was materially lower than the stop and Carter improvements. Correct, um, Mr. Merrill. So uh, to your point about hybrid projects in that category, um, I probably misspoke a little bit before the board policy for the highway safety program that you would all adopted in December 2019 is directed towards both systemic and hybrid projects. So it is captured within how um, our current investment strategy to try to improve those investment strategies or improve the safety outcomes. So Mr. Mayor, to your point, that is why we changed the policy to make more investments in yes. the systemic and hybrid um, improvements. Yeah, I just wonder if we put more into hybrid, would it further improve the fatalities? Because I was just struck by the material reduction in fatalities Yes. Hybrid. So could we allocate some of the money from the corridor and the spot into the hybrid? <clears throat> and so that is part of um, what the commissioner was referencing, um, a potential presentation from Mark Cole to report out on um, kind of a first annual report on implementation of the systemic safety action safety plan, which would um, show where the investments are being made, the types of uh, uh, strategies that are underway. Um, this was uh, a lot of presentations to the board uh, a couple of years ago for that. So Mark will be able to report out on that. Um, so he can show you where we are targeting investments and then later this year coming back to the board with where would we want to spend uh, a, 
where do we need to be investing for our next implementation plan? Because this one is well underway and making great progress. So Mark will be able to report and provide more information on that. Um, Mr. Merrill, this is almost a transition period because we invested so much in spot improvements. Now we're moving to make those investments. And so coming back and seeing if we want to even shift more commissioner to systemic and hybrid. But your observation is correct. In fact, we should let Mr. Merrill give that presentation. <laughs> just, just anecdotally, it's, it's very interesting. When I, when I lived in Texas, the huge there was a huge issue with children not being put in their in their car seats mm. and, and being thrown from cars. And here, where I live now in the Stanton district, there is there seems to be a high incidence of people overcorrecting when they go off the side of the road on all the curvy roads. And you know these these hybrids seem like that addresses that. <clears throat> Um, we hope so. Madam Secretary. Mr. Kaswitz. Yes, a question for Margie. Um, Margie, annually when we have this discussion, um, I, I guess I, I've typically expressed some frustration about our inability to, to better understand the relationship between speed and some of our safety improvements. And um, I guess it was a little over a year ago, you you um, made contact and we, we talked through options and opportunities to better understand uh, and although we can't enforce uh, we, we can inform if we have a better knowledge of where speed is leading to serious injuries and fatalities uh, we started a program under under your guidance that um, was using cell phone tracking data to give us um, potentially near real-time information on speed throughout the Commonwealth. And I just wonder, uh, and then COVID um, kind of slowed things down and, and stopped many of the initiatives that we we're involved in. Is, is that a program that you, you still think has merit and that we could possibly restart? So, uh, Mr. Kasperitz, um, great to hear from you. Uh, that is, we kicked off a meeting with a consultant back in late February. We've been working on gathering data, um, fleshing out a little bit more detail about what we would put into a model to be able to, to do this. I think if you'll recall, kind of a proof of concept was developed yes. on how we would start combining um, uh, speeding data and then um, where crashes were occurring as well. Uh, we're working pretty closely with DMV on this um, as well because they actually had implemented something with through a contract with Virginia Tech looking at the interstate system. So our modeling effort will focus on the non-interstate system. Um, so that is, um, I don't have an updated schedule yet, but we are gathering the data right now. Um, we've had several meetings now with our consultant to start building out the, the tool that would facilitate that. So we are looking very much at that right now. And is there is there a, a time for completion of the consultant's report, Margie? I can. Um, I think in the next couple of weeks, I'll have a, a firm schedule that we can share. Can Can, can I, um, I just separate from this get get an update at some point in the next couple of weeks on just yes. the you know expectation and, and the objectives that have come from the uh, early discussions? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? So, Commissioner, I, I do believe that, you know, putting together um, a, a, a more comprehensive safety presentation would be really helpful for the board. Um, so, anyway, okay, we'll move forward on that. Thank you, Margie. Yes, ma'am. Thank and you. Everyone can continue, you know, to reach out to Margie with any other thoughts um, regarding setting the targets as well. We have a month to try to pull this together. Absolutely. Okay. With that, Jen DeBrule, you're back. Oh, no. Sorry, Commissioner. <laughs> I guess I already used all my, <laughs> words, my allotment of words, so I'm happy to. Yeah, I, I jumped right down to the TRIP program. No, no this is really important. So, um, yes, welcome. Madam Secretary, members of the board, I wanted to revisit uh, a topic that we haven't heard of in probably about a year, year and a half, and, and that has to do with our special structures. Uh, if you recall, back in 2018, the department uh, had undertaken a, a review of our 
maintenance program area as a whole, really focusing on our performance of our pavements, bridges, and at that point in time, identifying special structures. Um, during this review, it, it really became a, apparent uh, in that comprehensive review that we really needed a long-term sustainable plan and a funding mechanism to ensure that we were properly investing in Virginia's assets. Uh, special structures, uh, if, if you've forgotten over this last 18 months, uh, are those assets such as our tunnels, movable bridges, and complex structures that if they should become impeded uh, or fail to operate in some way, shape, or form, they could cause significant uh, disruptions to our traffic, uh, impact maritime traffic, result in large detours, and negatively impact uh, Virginia's economy and uh, our military readiness in some parts of the Commonwealth. As I've previously briefed the board on, on a number of occasions, uh, many of these facilities have components uh, that are well beyond their useful life and funding in the, in the past has been very limited to much more of a philosophy of, uh, wait for it to break and then we'll fix it. Uh, and, and the example or uh, an example of this is back in 2018, 2019 timeframe where the James river bridge in the Hampton roads district was struck by lightning and, uh, blew out our, uh, capacitors. Due to or a large percentage of our capacitors, and due to the nature and the age of those capacitors, we only had a handful of spares on on site to be able to replace, and the residual had to either be bought off of eBay, or had to be hand wound to be to get the bridge uh, functioning again. Again, and that caused a three day delay. In we had to shut that bridge to maritime traffic. We kept it open to vehicular traffic and we shut that bridge to maritime traffic for upwards of three days. Um, that review, the comprehensive review really culminated in 2019 uh, with the, the adoption of the comprehensive review document as a whole and the adoption of our pavement and bridge performance measures. And if you recall during that same conversation, uh, we included a 50 year plan to be able to address our special and unique structures out there. And we made during that same presentation, a commitment to come back to the Commonwealth Transportation Board and, and, and look at the department developing what's known as a health index for each of these structures. Next slide, Michael. So culminating with that final report, uh, VDOT implemented those findings uh, and we're moving down the path of pavement and, and bridge performance measures. Uh, part of that program was that we would allocate $50 million a year out of our maintenance program to special structures. Uh, and most of those funds are dedicated to the operations, the day-to-day -day -day operations of those facilities. Uh, during that same period of time, uh, we've been working with the secretary's office uh, and, and others to be able to advance concept, these concepts to be able to advance the special structures program. Uh, in 2019, we did have two pieces of legislation that did make it through the General Assembly, uh, House Bill 2784, sponsored by Delegate Hodges, and Senate Bill 1749, uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Senator McDougal. And, and that legislation was entitled the Robert O. Norris Bridge and Special Structures Program and Fund. Uh, however, the, those two pieces of legislation, while creating the fund, did not assign funding to, that, to the program as a whole. Uh, the good news is that uh, through the work over the last uh, three years since, uh, frankly, uh, I said to the board that special structures are some of those structures that do keep me awake at night uh, in this position, that we've been very successful with working with the secretary's office and, again, others, including the governor's office, to be able to have special structures included in the governor's omnibus bill that was signed into legislation in 2020. 
Uh, part of that legislation that did pass was that uh, we would have a slow ramp up with funding of special structures. We would look at five, we were anticipating $5 million this fiscal year or upcoming fiscal year, 30 million in fiscal year 23 and fully funding that program with an additional $80 million a year uh, in 24. Uh, as we were working through the development of the six year plan this spring, uh, we recognized that, the, that there was an opportunity from balancing the entire program out that as well as understanding the immediate needs of funding our, our special structures program, we've been able to allocate $60 million this year uh, with full implementation in FY23 now. So uh, what I'm about to present to you today is a, a, a very quick overview of some of the projects that we're looking to fund in this year's six-year plan uh, that we would take to uh, the adoption of the six-year plan at our June meeting as well as talk to you a little bit about the, the health index and where we stand on the development of that. Uh, next slide, Michael. And you can advance one more. Next slide. Uh, you should have in your package uh, a, a, an overview of where we see projects uh, being funded for our special structures over the next six years. I did say that we are working from a 50 year plan. Uh, this is going to show the more immediate needs that we have within the program area, the bridges or structures or tunnels that we look to advance during this first six years that are the most critical uh, to be able to maintain the, the integrity of these uh, facilities as well as their operations. Uh, one thing that I will note, uh, and this is somewhat of a disclaimer about the pictures that you're going to see. Uh, they are somewhat graphic in nature if, if you're looking at the structural components. These structures and facilities are safe for travel. If there is at any point in time that I felt or my team felt that they were unsafe, we would take the appropriate action, which would include everything from posting a bridge to a weight limit to fully shutting it down to traffic. So I, I want to reassure the, the, the Commonwealth Transportation Board members and the secretary that these structures are safe and, and viable for traffic at, as they currently stand today. Next slide. So my intent uh, is to really walk through a couple of the examples of, of projects that are going to be programmed that you saw on the previous slide, we are going to advance $60 million uh, next year. And some of these are multi-year projects. I should note uh, one thing, and, and I'll get to this uh, in an example later on, but there is a lead time to the time that we place an order for a piece of equipment to the time that it will be installed. So uh, to be able, to, this is somewhat of an orchestrated effort to be able to make sure that we are taking proactive steps uh, in, in, in placing orders for equipment in, in year one maybe, and then being able to install it in years two and three. So uh, what you see here is in the Bristol district, this is the Big Walker and East River Mountain Tunnels. Uh, I'm gonna combine our conversation. They are two distinct tunnels. Uh, but I'm going to walk you through uh, because both of them operate as the same. These are all on I-77 in the Bristol District. Again, in the upper left-hand corner, you see what is a result in 2014, a tractor trailer fire uh, that, it, that took place in the tunnel. Uh, because of the quick response of, of our team, fire and emergency uh, management personnel, we were able to evacuate all persons out of the tunnel uh, efficiently without any injuries or fatalities. But this certainly highlights the need that we needed to be, we need to focus on fire life and safety uh, connections within both of the mountain tunnels that we have, recognizing that they are used for hazardous material shipments. Uh, so the majority of the work that you will see over the next six years is, is for ventilation systems, 
uh, our stand pipes to be able to allow adequate uh, fire suppression by our by local fire departments, as well as fire fire suppression systems within it, uh, without the need for our our emergency fire fire and EMS personnel. Um, Ventilation in our tunnels are very important when we do have a fire to be able to whisk the smoke away from uh, getting it away from the people and motorists so that we can safely evacuate them. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a continuation of some of the items that uh, are going to be undertaken as part of the, the uh, investment in Big Walker and East River Mountain Tunnels. Uh, continuation of our ventilation upgrades, uh, predominantly in, in the upper portion, you can see some structural repairs that are necessary uh, to be able to maintain the structural integrity of the facility. You can see in the lower right hand corner uh, on that slide, you might be thinking, what is that? Well, that in the center of that picture, that is groundwater seeping into the tunnel and we're going to need to be working to get that away from our structural components as a part of these this project. Next slide. The next uh, special structure that we have is is in the Fredericksburg district, Matthews County. This is the Gwen's Island movable bridge that was built in the 1940s or open to traffic in 1940. If you recall, there have been a number of times, Madam Secretary, that uh, one summer I recall that we did get a note during a board meeting to say that the Gwen's Island Bridge is stuck in the open position due to heat and we needed to have the fire department come out and hose it down so that we could close it. So, uh, again, this True is- True story. It, it, it was or is, um, but, but this facility is in immediate need of, of replacement of some of their mechanical system. You can see worn uh, drive gears that are there that do slip during operations, whether it be opening the bridge or closing the bridge. And, and this is probably one of my favorites is the, the generator placed down in the lower right hand corner that that is far exceeded its useful life and, and really looks like it should be in a museum at this point in time. Um, we do have some structural repairs that are needed to be able to keep the facility operational until such time it can be replaced under part of, under this program as a whole. So the Gwen's Island Bridge will be the first bridge to be replaced uh, under the current program that we have. So if you recall, one of the reasons why we're, why the special structures program was advanced is so that we could have dedicated money for this because we knew that it would not score very well in the funding programs that we had. So maintaining the integrity of these structures is paramount. Uh, next slide, Michael. So Madam Secretary and members of the board, this is the Norris Bridge. Uh, you may have been one of the recipients of a lot of our six year improvement program public comments that we have received over the last during the comment period of our six year program. Uh, this facility is one of those is another bridge that is due to be programmed for replacement under this under the special structures program. But as you can see that uh, um, we do have a number of items here that we would advance uh, over the next six years, some of which are spot structural improvements. But I will call out uh, the attention of the board that we have spent nearly $50 million over the last 10 years uh, doing significant rehabilitation and maintenance activities to it, including within the last two, uh, completing our repainting, pr our preservation program on repainting. We had some pins that were replaced and a major bridge deck uh, that was replaced, I believe, last summer. Uh, so, we do have as part of the replacement program and the special structures in the lower right hand corner uh, we are advancing preliminary engineering in this suite of projects over the next six years that would include a preliminary alignment study a bathrometric uh, survey mapping the the, the bottom uh, of the riverbed as well as uh, geotechnical <laughs> investigations so as part of anticipating the replacement, we are advancing some of the, the preliminary engineering on this facility. Next slide. 
moving to the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the Hampton Roads District. Uh, this is the Berkeley Bridge, which connects Fort Smith with Norfolk. It services about 100,000 vehicles a day. Uh, what you have here and what we're going to be advancing, again, is a suite of projects. Uh, we would be looking to replace the Warren Drive gear. I should note that the westbound component of this bridge was built in 1952. Uh, and so while we probably have replaced this once already, it's due for another replacement. Uh, and, and again, the lead time to manufacture some of these components can be upwards of a year in the manufacturing process. So if this drive gear fails, uh, we're going to have to make the decision about keeping the bridge open to vehicular traffic or keeping it in the open position to allow for maritime traffic. So this is the time that we need to be taking a very proactive viewpoint of our special structures and, in, and making those uh, proactive investments into uh, the facilities. Next slide. Uh, switching gears to the existing Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnels, uh, the, the existing westbound tunnel was built in 1957 and the eastbound tunnel uh, built in 1976. And we're advancing or, or proposing to advance a number of projects here, one of which you can see in the, in the center of the stage. This is a diagram of the tunnel itself. Uh, and what you see is the individual on the left-hand corner uh, shining a light, and that is actually the underside of the driving surface in in the tunnel in the westbound lanes. So we have spalling of concrete, exposure of rebar on what vehicles are driving on. So uh, part of this suite of projects is to advance uh, the rehabilitation of that invert slab. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we would be proposing to remove uh, the op our, our ceiling tiles in this case, which is providing the upper air duct and replacing the ceiling tiles with jet fans to be able to remove the over height restrictions that are causing a significant number of uh, tractor trailer turnarounds on the island and impeding it. By doing this, we anticipate that we would eliminate 80 to 90% of the truck turnarounds on any given day. Uh, it, it's interesting, or I'll state that by replacing the ceiling tiles with jet fans, uh, this project will then have our jet fans in all the tubes, including the brand new tunnel that's under construction now. So we would be consistent in how we handle our, our airflow system, regardless of what tunnel facility uh, you're traveling through. Next slide. The high-rise bridge, and I should point out, we do have the high-rise bridge, new portion under construction, but the existing high-rise bridge that was built in 1972 will stay in operation even with the new high-rise bridge. Uh, this is a movable bridge that services almost 90,000 vehicles a day, uh, and we're proposing to do some bearing seat replacements and machinery basing of the bascule span. Uh, I will note the, the picture to the right, and this is where I said that if we ever saw that a structure was in an unsafe condition, we would take immediate action, which includes closing that facility. But this, this is just a picture of what we found during a routine inspection in 2019 on a secondary member. It is not critical to the support of the structure, but again, it's something that we need to take care of uh, in the immediate future. Next slide. Uh, switching gears to Northern Virginia, we do have a tunnel in Northern Virginia that's the Roslyn Tunnel, which is really a series of bridges that create this tunnel with park space above it. Uh, what you see here is that we're, we're in need very similar to our other tunnel facilities where we have air ducts above it for ventilation and uh, fire control that we need to be taking a look at our uh, ceiling tile and how those ceiling tiles are hung. These tiles weigh approximately 500 pounds a piece, and we need to take a look at their hanger system 
but also uh, looking to are there other means other than uh, a tunnel or a, a tile facility going to something as I just showed you on the HRBT with a jet fan. Uh, so we are looking to advance uh, an airflow study in here as well as to uh, adopt a program to potentially completely replace and remove our ceiling tiles. Next slide. Uh, and one, just one more set uh, is uh, another, another movable bridge uh, that we would be looking uh, to enhance during this. On the right-hand side, we're looking to replace a, a generator that has significant reliability issues, so much so that we had to put a temporary generator on the facility to make sure it, the lift span continued to operate on, on demand. So. This is a removable bridge that was built in 1966 and is the third of three bridges that would be replaced under the special structures program. Next slide. So also part of the suite of projects that we would be looking for the board to endorse is uh, the department setting, setting aside $5 million in, in funds for those emergencies that do come up that are unexpected uh, th this includes what we had to address on the James River Bridge in that lightning strike in 2018, as well as a, a power outage on the East River Tunnel that reduced our power uh, availability to our ventilation fans by as much as 50%. So there are unknowns that are going to come up in this, uh, and so we're looking to set aside a, a small amount of funding out of the 60 million to be able to advance, whether it be preliminary engineering or be able to react to certain situations. Next slide. So that's really the suite of projects, but I also wanted to take this time to uh, advise the board on where we stand with the development of the health index that I advised back in 2019 that we would advance. And that health index, just as a reminder, was so that we could take a review of each of these 25 structures and look at them in a consistent manner uh, and, and look to developing targeted projects that were based upon the risk of the facility at a particular time. Uh, and this is really going to help us better uh, address and, and program projects on an annual basis to make sure that we're addressing the, the highest risk of, of these assets to make to help ensure uh, that if something does be, we will be taking proactive measures to ensure things do not break and if they do break that we have a, a mechanism to be able to make sure uh, that it's kept open the traffic so next slide uh, just as a, a a quick overview, that health index that we were looking for to be developed it would not only be for our uh, structures that we have out there, but also looking to adapt that for our movable bridges and our tunnel facilities, recognizing that they're very unique. Uh, I'll say that th this health index is a first in the country to be developed. Uh, we have had outreach with our counterparts throughout the country through the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and their technical subcommittees. Uh, they are very interested in knowing what we're doing, uh, and, but no one has developed what we're doing. Uh, so in those conversations, we also learned that there's a potential uh, where we might be able to take a, a risk assessment tool that is being used by the Army Corps of Engineers and look to adapt that. So we have an upcoming meeting with the Corps to be able to look at their, their, their protocol. We certainly don't want to recreate the wheel, but I think we are in a position where we're actually creating a wheel at this point in time. Uh, just as, as a reminder, in the next two slides, I'm going to show you what I mean by this, is that we're looking at those health index measures to be really looking at the individual structures themselves, but also the systems that make up the entire structure itself. So next slide, Michael. So if I take this, if I take the movable bridges as an example, 
at the very lowest indicator that, that might be out there, it, it may be a switch, it might be a gearbox, something like that may fail. And that failure may cause that bridge to remain open or closed. Uh, and so what we're looking at is ranking uh, what the remaining useful life of those, uh, the, those components are and rolling them back up, uh, in, whether it be in the electrical system, the structural system, uh, the house itself that's going to run the system or the mechanical system and really look at this health index on the system components and roll it up to measure the, the movable bridge. Next slide. And very similar to our tunnels that, that I think I've used before, how do we measure the health of those facilities? Uh, the, tunnels, the tunnels are a little bit more complex. We have seven systems and about 30 elements that we're looking at. Uh, frankly, as I said, uh, we could have a pump at the very bottom of that tunnel uh, of our water crossings, at least in the Hampton Roads area, that has reached its service life, needs to be replaced. Uh, but it, we recognize that if that that pump fails, we do have some other pumps that can, can take its place, but um, we run the risk of, of flooding a tunnel if we aren't maintaining that, that asset appropriately. So what is that risk? What is the probability of failure and how do we roll each of those components up to better understand not only the health of the component, but also the health of the facility? Uh, my expectation moving forward is that in September, I will have the chief of maintenance and operations be in a position to bring back to the board an update on exactly where we are and give you an example of that health index it should be mature by then, and so I'm hoping to have it, or I will have it, I'm not going to hope, uh, we will have it at the September board meeting. Madam Secretary, that concludes my presentation and overview of special structures, and um, we'll be happy to take any questions the board has. And yes, Commissioner, thank you. Um, I did tell the board this, <laughs> when I jumped to the TRIP program immediately, which was um, somewhat interesting on my part because I knew how important this particular presentation was going to be. I will say that, you know, um, to me, it's an example of what this administration um, has really prioritized and no longer kicking the can down the road. And we just have to address many major issues that we've had and we have tried to do this over these um, past few years. Commissioner Britt deserves so much credit for changing the focus for how we look at maintenance and state of good repair and the life cycle of assets to be proactive and managing that life cycle rather than waiting for something to break, rather than waiting for something um, to be deficient. So it has been a true shift in our perspective in dealing with the assets that we have um, and special structures are an incredibly important component. Um, the connectivity that these structures provide are um, incomparable. Uh, they are integral to the system. And the fact that, you know, early on we were able to get legislation but could not get funding for these structures um, with the omnibus transportation um, bill, we were able to fund these structures not at the full level that we were hoping. I sent a text over to um, John Lawson to see if he could tell me exactly how the, the finances on this were moving forward. It's less than we had anticipated in fully funding um, the um, special structures. However, the programs in place, revenues are being directed to special structures, which over the life cycle of commission, I believe is gonna require about $8 billion. Um, but we have started this process. We are setting up what I believe is an important prioritization process through this health index, um, really dealing with what is most urgent uh, and being very deliberate about how we manage this process, um, making sure at all times these structures are safe. So uh, with that, I will um, open um, any questions or comments um, to the board. Um, Madam Secretary, John Malvin here. I, I think Steve's 
done a great um, deal of work here, particularly in the health index. I think that's so important. My question to him is those components um, that represent the health index for a tunnel or bridge, are they weighted in any way as to one area would be more critical than others in terms of getting the health index score? Madam Secretary, the, the, Mr. Malbum, the, the answer is yes. We're looking at actually what that would mean. And, and if that component did fail, it is much more significant to the operations of the facility. So yes, we are looking at that. And that's a part of the ongoing gyrations that we have today um, uh, as we develop it. It, it. Again, this is the first in the country. Uh, I, it, it has taken a, a little bit to get here. We're in the refinement mode and we will get down into the details in September, I promise you. But yes. Yeah. Uh, one last comment, Ed, is uh, you were mentioning the Berkeley Bridge making the decision whether we had a major failure, be a drive gear or whatever, and we had to decide whether to keep it up or keep it down. Either one of those decisions is devastating to our region. Yes. And it kind of just emphasizes the importance of this conversation. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, uh, Mr. Malbin, uh, that is one of those decisions that I that does keep me up at night because that decision has to be made and, and it's a failure to the maritime industry on one hand uh, and a success to motorized traffic or it's going to be a failure to motorized traffic and a success to the maritime traffic. It is, it is a lose-lose. It's not a win-win. So, yes, I agree. That's why we need this. That's why having the omnibus bill and the funding to be able to advance these projects in the immediate, and, and we have demonstrated needs today that have been deferred long enough. Madam Secretary, may I jump in? Yes, Mr. Miller. Um, thank you, Steve. Great presentation. Um, to Mr. Malvin's point, you know, those who are not familiar with sort of the the region beyond the Berkeley Bridge, we've got a couple shipyards there, a concrete plant, a Luxstone facility, a big tug shipping company. So to his point, it's um and to your point it'd be it would be horrible all the way around. Um no good answer there. But in any case, um I'm Steve, we set aside thirty million dollars out of O and M initially, and then we've gotten the omnibus bill. Are we adding those two together? How, um, uh, so the 30 is sticking and we're adding to it. And so I see you nodding yes. The, the other question or other point is when you bring this back, it'd be, you're showing us in slide four what we're anticipating spending in the next six year plan. Um, can we keep an eye on the long term ball, the, the, the $8 billion and sort of whether that sort of how you, see that um, going forward so that we understand how fast we're getting there or how long it's taken us to get there and sort of what the what the plan is for each structure um, there's no total on that on that six-year plan on uh, total columns so it's sort of hard to sort of see that but if we thought something was going to take 300 million dollars how long do we think it's going to take to get there and sort of what are the steps Madam Secretary, uh, Mr. Miller, I, let me advance your first question of whether or not it, the, the first infusion is the 50 million. It's not 30 million, but we were looking to fund 50 million out of the maintenance program. And that really is looking at our ongoing operations, our tunnel workers, the facilities, the electricity, keeping the lights on is what I what I've said in the past. Um, and that's really for our bridge tenders and things of that nature. Um, you, you are absolutely correct. The additional funding coming in this year, we're projected at 60 million, ramping up to 80 million. That is in addition to the 50. Uh, if you recall back in 2019, we had identified that to be able to adequately fund this 50 year plan, we were looking at 150 million a year in to totality. Uh, to keep up with with those projects, we are only even when it's fully funded. Even though it is a ramp up in the outer years with CPI, uh, we are looking at about 130 million dollars in 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 funding. So, while 
we got the majority of what we asked for and and, and, and I'm very thankful for that. We did not get everything, but uh, we're advancing it. Uh, Mr. Miller, with regard to your question about in the outer years, this is where that health index comes into play that are we going to be in a position that we're going to be able to set aside monies to be able to replace the Gwens Island Bridge, the Norris Bridge, and those things. We do have them programmed right now. In the program over the next uh, several years, uh, from 2030 out is what I said, to for all the way out to the Benjamin Harris and bridge out to 2052 looking at that replacement cycle but uh in the short term we have some very immediate needs that we're going to have to contend with to take that proactive stance to help ensure the integrity of these facilities i i will say that there may be an opportunity to advance the replacement of some of these structures but that's going to be in the outer years and we're going to have to let the first couple years solidify I hope I answered your question. Madam Secretary. Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir, you did. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Commissioner, I think you've done an excellent job uh, of looking at the issues that are involved with special structures. I think it's vitally concerning uh, around the state within the individual regions. We have individual projects that are of concern locally, but certainly within the Hampton Roads area, we probably have, I think we have 55% of the 25 projects uh, in the Hampton Roads district itself. We probably have 90% of the asset value uh, in the area. And that's basically because it's tunnels and major bridges um, due to, and, and supporting, if you will, whatever's happening in Hampton Roads with the port and or the military. So. I think it's it's critically important, as both Mr. Malbin uh, and Mr. Miller have talked about the uh, the the Berkeley Bridge, um, which is a critical asset downtown uh, and is uh, pretty much in jeopardy at this point, based on its I understand current condition. So I appreciate looking at the the health index and bringing that back in September, but I'm also looking at looking to making sure that over time, recognizing the crit critic criticality of funding um, that we try and find a way to be able to increase that because we're going to definitely need it um, with this program. And we're looking at the critical issues having to do with these 25 assets, but there are a number of other assets that are a little bit smaller that drop down in that next in the next 25 to take, to take it to 50 level, if you will, of, of critical assets. So I appreciate the work that's being done. It's timely. It's important. I'm very much looking forward to the uh, the index and the development of that and um, looking through the index to getting it to numbers that we can work with to get some of these assets repaired. I will just also add that recognizing um, the urgency of, of this particular program um, that with our federal delegation, we have put forward as possible earmarks um, through um, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the tunnels, um, which are um, our uh, earliest need, but also looking for opportunities um, in Washington to accelerate the entire program. The commissioner mm -hmm. and his team have prioritized or, or are prioritizing the needs that we have we're not trying to take anybody out of line for this, but what we're really trying to do is see how can we accelerate the entire program. And that's, you know, how we're trying to look at it from a systemic point of view. Okay, anybody else? Commissioner, thank you very much. Um, now it's Jennifer DeBrule. <laughs> You're back. I'm back. Uh, good morning again, Madam Secretary and members of the board. I'm really excited to be here this morning to brief you on our transit ridership incentive program and our draft CTB policy uh, to implement uh, this new program. Uh, next slide, please. So this, um, this program, the transit ridership incentive program was established uh, in the 2020 omnibus transportation bill. Uh, the intent of the program is exactly the, what it's named. It's intended to um, incentivize and increase ridership um, 
and our transit systems around the Commonwealth in two key ways. Uh, in our urbanized areas of the state, uh, we're looking to promote that increased ridership through um, provision of uh, improved regional connectivity, and then um, on a statewide basis, look at uh, projects and pilots that would uh, reduce the barriers to transit use for low income individuals. Uh, we did delay the implementation of this program uh, due to the impacts of COVID-19, uh, but that I will say was really a, a blessing for us because it gave us time to put a lot of thought and a lot of research into other similar uh, projects and programs around the country. And I'm very grateful that we have uh, Lauren Fishbein on our team as our program manager who has really poured her heart and soul into developing the policy that I have the pleasure to present to you today. So we can go to the next slide, please. I think it's always a good uh, place to start is talking about funding and the funding that is available for the TRIP program. Uh, the omnibus bill sets aside 6% of the Commonwealth Mass Transit Fund to support uh, both elements of the, of the TRIP program um, as part of our annual programming process. Uh, we did get a little extra boost uh, for fiscal 22 uh, with the inclusion of $10 million in the um, 2021 transportation initiative funding that is dedicated specifically to zero fare program pilots. Uh, that is one time funding. And that's why uh, that fiscal year 22 number is, is a little bit higher. Uh, the rest of the years you'll see our funding uh, begins to phase in uh, in uh, we see the full um, benefit of that 6% of the, of the program starting in uh, fiscal 24. So beyond that first year infusion for um, the zero fare program, uh, the way the legislation is drafted is that up to 25% of the program annually can be utilized for zero fare uh, in low income projects on a statewide basis. Um, we can go to the next slide and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the funding for the regional route. Uh, the regional route side is a little more complex in terms of how that funding is, uh, is to be allocated. Uh, the legislation does provide that uh, the funding be allocated to uh, our larger urban areas on a proportional share, uh, looking at a five-year rolling average. And as we've shared with you previously in going through our six-year improvement program and talking about transit capital and projects, our program tends to have some um, some lumpiness to it. it, it tends to go in a little bit of waves. And so that five-year rolling average gives us the ability uh, to, to smooth out uh, some of those high points over time across those urbanized areas. So when you look across the regional routes program, about 42% of the funding goes to Northern Virginia, 27% to Hampton Roads, 18% to Richmond, and then the remainder to Roanoke, Fredericksburg, Lynchburg, Blacksburg, and Charlottesville. Uh, these percentages will need to be revisited once we have um, data available from the 2020 census, but this definitely gives us a place to start uh, as we start looking at funding these projects as the program moves forward. Next slide, please. So I started out by saying we, we had time to do a lot of research and really be thoughtful in how we develop this program policy. Uh, we did that through a lot of stakeholder engagement as well. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next couple of slides talking about how we've engaged our stakeholders in the development of this recommended policy. Next slide, please. So in November of last year, we issued a request for ideas. This is something that's a little uh, unique for us. Uh, it wasn't a funding application. In fact, we uh, told folks when we put it out that uh, that it wasn't gonna have any funding tied to it at all, that we were really looking for our um, partner agencies around the Commonwealth to come with a, to us with their ideas and their concepts and things that they would look to uh, want to fund through the TRIP program as it evolves. And so we were really pleased. We got uh, a good response from around the Commonwealth. You can see from the little blue dots on the map, we had good geographic uh, distribution in our responses and we received 23 ideas from 12 different transit agencies. Uh, we were also, um, I think, pleasantly surprised that those ideas were almost equally split between regional connectivity projects and zero fare and low income projects. And I think that again is evidence of how much uh, we have focused the last year on equity and uh, look, looking at our transit programs in a different way. Uh, next slide, please. 
so as we uh, looked at those uh, requests for ideas, responses that we got, um, we, we basically recruited those respondents to join us in the series of working groups. And we had a, a working group for regional connectivity. We had a working group for our uh, zero fare and low income side of the program and really uh, used those uh, volunteers to uh, dive into the details and get um, their input on what uh, kind of provisions would make this program successful right out of the gate. And we learned a lot from them. And so I'm very grateful for the folks that gave us their time to be part of those conversations. Uh, there are several recommendations that you can tie directly to provisions of the policy, uh, but I'm going to point out three key things. On the regional connectivity side, uh, we heard how important it was going to be uh, to have input and to have um, a regional view or a regional perspective as part of that application process to give us some insight on, on regional priorities, maybe thinking beyond the transit agency, and also on regional travel patterns. And so you'll see as I walk through um, the next few slides on the programs, you'll see how that's reflected in um, that regional collaboration and partnership as part of the application process. Uh, we also heard a lot on both sides of the program about funding duration. Um, we heard that uh, short term, one year funding uh, would really not help support meaningful um, pilots and meaningful and sustainable increases in transit ridership. Uh, so what you'll see in the policy as I walk through the remaining slides is um, a, a philosophy that provides funding over a, a certain a number of years uh, that declines as those projects come online and, and see that ridership increase. And finally, uh, obviously one of our key metrics for this program is ridership, um, but we also heard a lot uh, from our partners that um, while ridership is very important, there are other objectives that we also need to consider in evaluating the success of these projects. Uh, things like accessibility, congestion mitigation, and environmental benefits are also things that we should uh, document and uh, report on as part of uh, as part of the program. Next slide, please. So I want to walk through um, each of these elements of the program um, and give you a little bit more background on what types of projects uh, we. Uh, we anticipate seeing and we would consider eligible for each side of the program and also how we're going to evaluate them. So I'm going to start with regional connectivity. Uh, there are four areas of project eligibility and this is based in what language is in the code. Uh, first is the improvement and expansion of routes with regional significance. So we're looking at transit service uh, that provides cross jurisdictional or regional connectivity in Kind of congested corridors, either creating new routes or providing increased frequency on existing routes. Uh, second, we're looking at um, uh, the development and implementation of regional subsidy models. Uh, this is looking at how transit is funded from a regional perspective, building partnerships and increasing community engagement in regional transit. Uh, third is the creation of bus only lanes on routes of regional significance. And this is providing that infrastructure connection um, to help um, make that bus more efficient in how it travels and ha helping to meet uh, those commuting needs. Uh, and then finally, uh, the fourth area of eligibility is the implementation of integrated fare collection. And this would be um, you know, creating collaborative platforms where you know, different transit systems all work off of the same uh, platform in terms of fare collection. It could also con uh, consider things like contactless payment, and um, other elements that would improve fare collection uh, as part of the regional process. Next slide, please. So as we have for all of our um, transit grant programs, we have um, put together a proposed front scoring criteria. Um, in this, we have three uh, different areas that we would evaluate and score potential projects based upon. Um, as one of the key uh, focus areas for this regional connectivity program is, is really looking at regional mobility and reducing congestion. Uh, that is uh, the, the highest weighted measure at 60% of our scoring methodology, uh, reflecting the input we received from our partners as part of our working group. We have provided 30% of the score to be based on regional connectivity and regional collaboration. And finally, um, looking at cost 
per passenger and cost relative to project benefits. That's always an important part of any type of project evaluation and we've included that measure at 10% of our total score. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna shift gears and I'm gonna talk about the eligibility and scoring for our zero fare and low income side of the program. We have three areas of eligibility um, on this side of the program. And again, unlike our regional routes, zero fare and low income projects um, are, uh, there's statewide eligibility and we do anticipate seeing a broad range of projects both in urban and rural areas under this portion of the program. Uh, first area of eligibility is the provision of subsidized or uh, free transit passes to low income populations. This is something that uh, we've seen done in other parts of the country and uh, the Virginia Transit Association has a pilot project that they're uh, doing right now that is working on this through some funding out of the Department of Social Services. Our second area of eligibility is the elimination of fares on high capacity corridors. Uh, so this is looking at uh, zero fare zones and uh, zero fare corridors uh, that either um, have high ridership areas or serve um, low income populations and uh, vital services. Uh, that's a, a technique that we've seen used in, in some parts of the country prior to COVID. And then finally, the last area of eligibility is the deployment of an entirely fare free transit system. Uh, this is looking at kind of the broader spectrum of looking at uh, projects that would eliminate fares, um, but build the capacity in the future for those uh, programs to continue without uh, the funding and support of the TRIP program. Next slide, please. Uh, so for our zero fare and low income projects, we do have um, a scoring criteria as well. Uh, our first area of scoring would be looking at the impact on ridership. Again, that's one of the key uh, tenants of the program. That would be 40% uh, of the score. Uh, applicant commitment is something that, it, that we really see as very important to this part of the, um, a part of the program. Uh, really making sure that these pilot projects are based in um, good uh, operational planning, uh, that there is a, uh, a sense of community partnership and local government support going into that pilot uh, that would provide options for continued funding upon the completion of the pilot. And that uh, scoring is weighted at 20%. Uh, we also think it's very important to look at the implications uh, for equity and accessibility, um, making sure that we're looking at uh, the impact of the pilot uh, on low income or marginalized communities, looking at the benefits and the connections to areas of high need and looking, on our, looking at our equity emphasis areas as outlined in VTRANS. Uh, that element of the scoring is weighted at 20%. And then the final 20% is uh, focused on project schedule and readiness, looking at projects that are ready to be advanced uh, to implementation in the near term. Next slide, please. So as we look at projects um, for evaluation, there are really three key themes that we've focused on. Uh, we are looking for projects that are well-planned. We're looking for projects that uh, the transit system, the local government, whoever the applicant may be has has really put a lot of thought into it. Uh, they have identified very quantifiable measures of success. They have a very clear rationale um, behind the project, behind their target performance measures, and the project itself is supported by statewide, regional, and local transportation plans. Uh, second, it's very important that these projects are collaborative in nature. This is where that um, regional view uh, comes into play. We really do want to make sure that the you know, the regional entities, the localities that are served, and, and VDOT are engaged if a project has infrastructure needs. And we really wanna see projects that are built through strong partnerships uh, so that they have that foundation for success from the beginning. And finally, we're looking for projects that are quickly implementable. Uh, we're looking to um, move the needle and uh, improve transit ridership and accessibility right out the gate. Um, so we do want to see uh, projects that are ready to go, that have a strong rationale for uh, the funding that's being requested, that have the technical capacity to be able to deliver the project and have that quick implementation time frame. And I think this is a good time to also mention that the legislative language also requires us to report annually on uh, the outcomes of the TRIP program. Uh, so we'll be making our first report as part of DRPT's annual report to the General Assembly this fall. 
And so that will main, that will be incorporated in our annual report going forward. So we, we have that ongoing accountability and are gonna be watching these projects very closely to ensure that they're meeting their intended purposes and goals. Next slide, please. So I do want to talk a little bit about funding. Um, one of the things that we did here, and I mentioned earlier, is, is the need for, you know, a, a, a perspective on funding that goes beyond what just one year. And so we are looking at these as uh, multi-year uh, funding arrangements, multi-year project agreements, where the share of state funding would decrease as the project progresses. So there's two graphs on the screen. The one on the left is for the zero fare and low income uh, side of the program, which we're envisioning to be a four year commitment, which would include uh, state funding that first year at 80%. Uh, but that state commitment would reduce as the local commitment to backfill that fare revenue would increase with the fourth year of that um, pilot project being 100% locally funded. On the regional connectivity side, um, we are looking at a five-year model that would step down the state's commitment uh, to funding over time uh, in a way that is, is fairly similar to the commuter choice program, which we presented to you earlier this morning. Uh, I do want to add a caveat on the regional route on this regional connectivity side that some of these projects, we, we do want to leave some flexibility that, that routes may be eligible for continued continuation of funding beyond that initial pilot period uh, based on the availability of funding and the uh, performance of the project. Uh, so we're trying to uh, thread the needle a little bit here and provide funding that can support and sustain these projects as they get implemented, uh, but there's that commitment for continuation of the project uh, as that state commitment uh, is reduced over time and that allows us to bring new um, projects and pilots on board. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, uh, today we're giving you a, a presentation on our draft uh, CTB policy, which is also in your packet. Uh, we are going to release uh, that policy for public comment today. Uh, that will be open for 30 days of public comment, and it's our intent to bring uh, that trip policy back uh, to you next month along with a summary of the comments and the feedback that we receive for action. Uh, that will enable us to move forward in July to open an application period. We'll do, um, as we've done with this project uh, program establishment to date, we will do a lot of outreach to our eligible agencies, uh, closing that application period uh, towards the end of August, uh, and then moving into a technical evaluation process, which we would then come back to you with a funding recommendation uh, this fall and action to add those selected projects to our six year improvement program and allow those projects to move forward to implementation. Madam Secretary, that concludes my slides and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jennifer DeBrule. Um, Jennifer Mitchell, is there anything you would like to add at this time? I guess not. Um, so with that, I will open it up to the board. Madam Secretary. Mr. Smoot. Uh, Jennifer, I particularly appreciate the importance of local government financial engagement in these projects. These are very worthwhile projects, very important projects. And I think that our local governments need to be a part of that uh, funding equation. Thank you. Madam Secretary. Yes, Ms. Hines, I do want Jennifer Mitchell just text. She said she's trying to talk, but we're not hearing her. <laughs> Jennifer Mitchell, do you want to try again? Well, I've been kicked off twice, so maybe there is just something going on. So, Ms. Hines. Well, thank you. Um, so, Jen, I noticed that in the, the regional route funding, there, there are sort of buckets related to geography already. What happens uh, in the, the low income and zero fare thing? Is it, is it just whoever decides to step up, or is there some 
thinking about how that money might be divided? That, that's a great question. Um, the legislation really sets out a procedure on the uh, regional connectivity side, uh, but there isn't such language on the uh, zero fare low income side. So we have, I, I would say, some more flexibility uh, the language that was included in the 2021 budget, along with the um, $10 million to jumpstart those zero fare pilots, did specifically specify urban and rural pilots. Uh, so we are working to make sure that we have a good balance uh, as, as we anticipate um, specific applications that would be coming forward. But there is no um, that distribution of that funding um, in terms of geography. Thank you. And and similarly, I'm just thinking about metro. I'm thinking about metro riders, just just to like make the biggest bucket we could possibly make. Um, you know, in Nova, that would mean five local governments might come in and say we would like to pilot this in a particular way. There's probably not enough money to support that as a strategy. So. Um, so it would be fine for one jurisdiction, it, for Fairfax City to say, we wanna try this for our people inside the Metro system. So we we did, um, this, and you've hit on a point that, that came up in the um, request, request for ideas and some of the responses we received. Um, we did receive um, a request and it wasn't in Northern Virginia, but it came from a specific jurisdiction that was looking to provide free transit to the residents of their jurisdiction. And for, in that particular situation, it actually would cost the transit agency more to put the technology in place to allow that particular jurisdiction to ride for free. And so there are some real complexities around um, how these projects can be implemented and then what, you know, how how they are sustainable over time. And I think that that is something that we, um, I think we have some ideas around, but um, it, it is going to be something, and this is where that planning element comes into play. These projects or these pilots are gonna have to really be very well outlined and very well considered uh, in terms of like what the vision is for the future in order to apply. And so in something that is as complex as Metro, I, I am not sure that that is something that, um, I don't wanna to speak to any potential applications, but I, I think that would be on the more complex end of the potential pilots that we have already heard about in this first round. Thank you. Anybody, anybody else? Madam Secretary, this is Mark Merrill. Yes. Um, um, thanks, Jennifer. On the economics, the numbers that you're showing, do, do that, does that include the local jurisdiction contribution or would that be in addition to that? It's not clear to me when you talk about $130 million, probably $130 million over six years. And since there is this cascading commitment of the state <laughs> and an increasing commitment of the localities, does that $130 million include both contributions or just the state's? Uh, Madam Secretary, Mr. Merrill, that is just the state funding that would be programmed in the six year improvement program. That does not account for any local or other funding that would, would be used to support this project. So I'm looking at your slide, I guess it's where you show the funding over the four years. Um, it looks like the local commitment would at least be that amount, if not more. Again, I think that's that's where we're looking for um, for projects to come in for application that are are well planned and have been um, worked on in a collaborative space where there there is that commitment. Uh, so, I, I think that is, is a fair assessment that there uh, could be a corresponding local contribution that is of a similar amount as you look out into the future. And would you expect that the, the locality would have to commit to the four years? So they couldn't sort of do a bait and switch to the first two years with state money and then say, never mind, and keep their local money for something else. I think, Mr. Merrill, that's where we always get into a challenge because um, allocations by the Commonwealth are always subject to annual allocation and appropriation by the General Assembly. You see the same thing on the local government side. 
Um, so it it that is something that we have heard from our partners is it's going to be difficult to have as a firm commitment. Um, but we're trying to bet and, and we have the same, you know, the same kind of um, situations on our inside. So we're trying to work in good faith uh, with applicants uh, to come to the table with that um, community buy in and support to support those projects uh, as they are implemented and move forward. But that's a very, very valid point. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Merrill, that is why this is a pilot. Right. We we're I really just... trying to figure out, I think, you know, during COVID, it became very evident to us how essential um, or how vital uh, public transportation was to essential workers. And so how do we keep people connected and fares turned out to be an obstacle. So we are really trying to um, use this as an opportunity. We made the case to the General Assembly about using some of the COVID funds um, to explore these options. And that is what we're hoping to do. You know, our return on investment is really the service we can provide. And I think we will learn a lot <laughs> through this process. And um, we're hoping to move more people and connect more people. So that is why we are here. Um, but again, there are gonna be many lessons. Um, yes, Ms. Hines. I think you're muted. Um, there's a federal fund program that provides funding for police officers called the Edward Burns something something, and it has a, it's built the same way. So you get three or four years of funding and you have to commit and there are penalties around the, the not following through. So you might just want to look at that program because local governments are very familiar with it. It's how we've been adding police officers for years. Mary, what um, what is the name of that program? Well, it's Edward Burns, B-Y-R-N-E-S, and then it's something, something, and it's Justice Department. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> can't remember the something, something, remember the Edward Burns. Um, but it's a, it's a federal program that, that um, does the same thing this is supposed to do. You know, you put in a little bit of money to get the new police officers in year one, and then it walks you down but you have to commit, I, my memory is for two years past the, the federal funding. Otherwise, there are substantial financial pe penalties if you, you know, you do the bait and switch like Mark was talking about. So we might, you might just want to look at that again, uh, only because it's a, it's a program that's familiar to local governments. Everybody's used it to add police officers. So. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. We Thank you, Ms. Hunt. I just loved your answer, by the way. That would be an answer I would give. I appreciate that. A lot of you, Shannon, as I said. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. Anybody else? Okay. Um, let's take a 10 minute break and um, we will see you all back here at 1130 and we'll keep rolling through. But um, Everyone has been so attentive and still this morning. Why don't we just get up and move around and um, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Is everybody back? Yeah, we all here. Okay. Thanks for break. Yes, yes, and um, and I appreciate those of you who ask. Um, just, you know, we get so involved. I will say that um, Mark Merrill and Amy White responded, and it's the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Program. But Mary Hines, I'm going to choose to think of it as Edward Byrne what was it, Edward Byrne? Something, something. Something, something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, I appreciate these moments. But I did know how to spell Burns so they could find it. <laughs> Madam Just Secretary, we, we, are, we are live with the streaming. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay. Um, and I'm sure everybody appreciated that. So, um, Russ Dudley, are you up? 
I think you're going to be with us for a while. No, ma'am. I, these are, these are quick. I promise. Okay. I just meant you're here in sequence. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, good morning, Madam Secretary, members of the board. So I have three items for you. I have three items for you this morning, all of which uh, to prepare you for votes uh, to come in June. So we can get started on this first item. Uh, the first item is um, a request for a separate deallocation and a separate allocation of economic development access funds in Botetourt County in the, or at the Botetourt Center at Greenfield. This is a summary of our, of our economic development access policy, uh, as you may already know, but just to remind you, localities may receive up to $650,000 um, in total funds from the state, $150,000 of that must be matched. Localities must demonstrate that the state allocations we provide result in a capital improvement or a capital investment of five times the awarded allocation to avoid what we refer to as clawback of those funds. Um, typically, a locality will provide a bond in that amount, and we will release the bond once they show us the capital investment. The board policy is payback begins uh, after five years without adequate investment, but we do have a phased payback process, which provides localities another four years to complete their paybacks. So it's a phased payback approach. Next slide, please. So in 2019, the board approved a request for an allocation to Botetourt County at the Botetourt Center at Greenfield for a total allocation of $650,000. Since then, the county has attracted a new company that intends to provide significant investment to the business park, and this company has requested a different access lo uh, location to the park. Because of this, the county is requesting to cancel the existing EDA project in order to pursue, pursue the new project. Approximately $1,200 has been expended on the existing project, and if the deallocation is approved, uh, those funds will be repaid to the department. 30% of the design of the new access road has already been completed, and the new road is estimated to cost approximately $789,000, which allows the county to receive $644,500 in state economic development access funds for the project. The new industry is Munters, as some background for Munters. They are a manufacturer of industrial HVAC systems. Uh, they provide uh, services to a lot of different um, Businesses, but their largest use is uh, for their for their equipment is the data center market. So these big computer centers, um, they have 17 facilities statewide or worldwide, and they plan on investing 36 million dollars in the county to construct a 365 thousand dollar square feet facility with 10 thousand feet of that uh, dedicated to R&D. Uh, expectations that they will employ close to 200 employees and we'll have significant recruitment opportunities at Virginia Tech. So next slide, please. This slide is just a depiction of the, in blue, of the existing access project, and then um, in red, the new requested access project. The old project, you, as you can see, was quite a bit longer. It was 3,000 feet long. It did cross a jurisdictional channel and had some impacts to existing utilities. Um, the new the new project is is 840 feet long or so and has no significant impacts to the surrounding environment. Next slide. So with that, uh, in June we will bring a resolution and decision brief to the board uh, requesting cancellation of the current access project, and we will establish a new EDA project upon your approval uh, for the the new project. Um, after we enter a state aid agreement with the county, they, are, they intend to, pro to administer the project. We will receive a bond for them and they can get started on their project. So, do I have any questions on this project? Board, um, any questions or comments? Madam Secretary. Oh, I'm sorry. I have discussed this with both the district engineer and with the uh, County manager of Botetourt County. This seems uh, uh, a, a very uh, desirable change to make. There is an industry that is all set to come in, and uh, because the roadway is is shorter than what was previously proposed, there will be a slightly 
decrease the cost to the state, but considerably less maintenance and carbon footprint uh, by having a shorter roadway. So I hope we will be supportive of this when the time comes. Yes, sounds like a very impressive company. Yeah, Sweden based. Okay. All right, Mr. Dudley. Okay, so our next presentation, we can move on to the next presentation. And to the title slide would be fine. There you go. So we just heard about one of our more typical EDA projects. Uh, this is one that we don't see very often. In fact, we've only seen this type of um, EDA project in one previous occasion back in 2012. This is a request for a design only allocation for a major employment and investment project in the Shannon Hill Regional Business Park in Louisa County. So next slide, please. So this is the definition of a MEI project, what we refer to as an MEI project. It's identified in the code, but basically it is a project that supports a facility that is expected to generate $250 million of capital investment and create more than 400 full-time jobs. The Virginia Economic Development Partnerships makes these designations and they have designated the Shannon Hill Regional Business Park as an MEI site. Um, board policy for e economic development access projects provides for both design and construction allocations for projects uh, at these facilities. The maximum design only allocation is $650,000, just like in any other EDA, with 150,000 that being matched dollar for dollar by the locality. Again, the locality will issue a surety to, to, um, for those funds that we provide them, and we will release the surety once we approve the final plans from the locality. Next slide, please. This is just a quick comparison of the, the programs. Uh, the, you see the traditional uh, non-MEI program. This is the one we see quite often, $650,000, $150 match. As I mentioned, design only MEI is, is the same amount, but with construction, they can get two separate allocations over two separate years, uh, both at a million dollars with $500,000 of that being matched by the locality. So it's quite, quite a significant investment. Next slide. So here's a little background of the business park and the access road that is being proposed. Uh, the business park is located in Louisa County and is approximately a half a mile north of Gooseland County border and about three quarters mile north of I-64, so it's good proximity to the interstate. The business park totals um, 700 acres and design plans call for an 8,000 foot uh, of roadway improvements along Route 605. I have a picture for you here in a second with improvements to begin at the I-64 westbound ramp and end at the northern border of the business park. Uh, the project also includes a 3,500 foot four lane medium divided access road that goes into the business park. Um, design is expected to cost just over $787,000 um, uh, to complete the project. Next slide, please. So I don't think I've mentioned this, but the county is in um, discussion with an undisclosed business that would like to, um, with, and talks about moving into the locality. But you see everything in red here are improvements to the business park. Um, you see a second entrance, uh, a little, little high up that's not in red. They don't expect to need the second entrance till it's fully built out in 2035 or hopefully in 2035. Uh, traffic impact analysis have already been done, and by 2025, the park uh, expects to add about 2,300 trips per day along Route 605. That's the red road right there, with about 300 of those being truck traffic. When it's in, when it's fully um, built out, they do expect over 9,000 additional trips per day, with over 900 of those trips being truck traffic. So, next slide, please. So the next steps here, we'll bring a resolution and a, and a CTB decision brief to the board next month to vote on this. 
Uh, once we get the approval from the board, we'll enter to another state state aid agreement with them. We'll get their sure to your bond, and then once they approve, once we approve their designs, we will release the bond. Any questions on this? Mr. These are two great are projects. I'm sorry, I think I'm. I didn't. Um, oh, is Carlos Brown here? Okay, I'm sorry. Did anybody else have a question or comment? Uh, this is Allison. I just want to say that I had an opportunity to visit the site um, with the um, district administrator, and um, I, I, I think it's a great it's a great opportunity for Louisa County and the surrounding areas. Thank you. Excellent. I know I would like to go. We'll have to take a visit. Um, anybody else? So, um, we'll please keep us posted about uh, the the new business. We're excited to hear about them. All these right. Are, these Mr. are two Dudley. great. These are two great projects. All right, Mr. Dudley. So our next presentation, we can move to that, is uh, is just a, um, a preview of our June action for street maintenance payments for both the urban system and for Arlington and Henrico. Um, so next slide, please. And we can move on to the next slide. We can move on to the next slide. There you go. So this is a summary of the street maintenance payment process for our cities and urbanized towns. Uh, as you likely already know, since we come to you every every year for this, uh, VDOT provides street maintenance payments to all cities and towns with population over 3,500, as well as other towns that are identified specifically in the code. Um, annually, localities submit new mileage to us and um, and also deleted mileage. Um, and at the recommendation of the department, the board approves any of the, the new mileage each year. Collectively, all this mileage is known to us as the urban system. Our district and residency staff inspect arterial routes each year to ensure they meet ma minimum maintenance standards as determined by the department. Our payment rates in the urban system are calculated based on the budget uh, available for the entire urban system and the number of moving lane miles available during peak travel time. And the rates are further adjusted based on functional classification. So whether they're arterial or they're local or collector. Next slide, please. Arlington Henrico is slightly different. Of course, they're the only two counties in the state that operate their own um, road system. And uh, this is a summary of their program. The difference is, is that uh, or due to code language differences. Uh, for example, payments are based on total lane miles rather than moving lane miles. And there is no differential in payments based on functional classification. It's all one payment. And there are no annual inspections of arterial routes. It's interesting just to note that cities maintain the primaries, towns have the option to maintain primaries, and Arlington and Henrico do not maintain primary routes. Next slide, please. So, in addition to our street maintenance payments, we also include other locality payments as part of our street maintenance payment program. Uh, these include overweight truck permit fee revenue that is collected by the Department of Motor Vehicles and is distributed uh, per lane mile to all um, our, our localities. Last year, that rate or this current year, that rate was $1.93 a lane mile. Um, the city of Chesapeake is the only locality that operates and maintains movable bridges, and we heard a little bit about that. So we give earlier, so we we give them an extra million dollars a year to maintain those movable bridges. Uh, they have three of those. Uh, those payments began in 2005 and are approved by the board. And then localities host, uh, which hosts Virginia Port Authority tax exempt um, uh, facilities, or they have tax exempt real estate, are provided um, compensation for that last. For that lost revenue totaling one million dollars and that's four localities newport news portsmouth norfolk and warren county so altogether vdot provides about 400 million dollars to urban localities and another approximately seven million dollars to arlington and Rico to support their street maintenance payments so next slide please 
This year, we will have 85 cities and towns, as well as Arlington, Henrico, and um, participating in our payments payment program. Uh, if you recall, it was 84, but this year, the town of Dublin will assume maintenance responsibilities of their, of their roads. And uh, that was due to legislation in 2019, and they've been preparing the last year or so to take over those roads. Um, today, our budget is still pending and our certified lane miles are still pending. So we don't have final payment rates yet, um, but just for um, reference, I, I provided last year's payment rates. So you see for the cities and towns, they received just over $22,000 dollars per moving lane miles for arterials, $12,000 for locals and streets. Arlington received 19,406 miles for their um their miles and Henrico received 14,121 for their mileage. So next slide. This is what we anticipate to see this year. We anticipate uh, anticipate seeing a total of uh, 91 additional miles being added to the urban system. Uh, about 45 of that is attributed to Dublin. We had 14 localities increasing mileage. Uh, we did have none decrease mileage. Arlington should increase by about a mile. They're pretty close to fully built out. And then Henrico, about 14 lane miles will be added to their system. So next slide. So our next steps, once we verify uh, our, our mileage and get our final budgets, we'll be able to come up with the final payment rates. We'll include those payment rates in your package next month, along with the resolution and decision brief. So you'll see each locality's inventory as well as their payment rates. And uh, we will present that to the board for approval and they will begin their, um, their maintenance payments for 22. Have any questions? Um, any questions or comments? Okay, well, Mr. Dudley, thank you very much. You were very efficient. I try to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Okay, smart scale. Smart sales changes, I should say. Um, Kim Pryor. Good morning, Madam Secretary and members of the board. Um, while the presentation is coming up, uh, I will be presenting on two uh, proposed project changes for smart scale projects in Salem and Lynchburg District. Next slide, please. As a reminder, uh, the smart scale policy states that a project that has been selected for funding has to be rescored if the scope or the cost of the such that the relative to the funding request would change. Also, if the smart scale cost uh, increases above the threshold shown on the slide, then board action is required. Next slide. Finally, the smart scale policy also states that a project that has been selected for funding through one of the smart scale programs may only be canceled by action of the board. And in the event that a project does not advance to construction, uh, the locality or organization may be required to repay any funds spent on the project. Next slide. The first project I'll review with you is in Salem District. It's the Route 311 and 419 intersection improvement. Next slide. This project was submitted by Roanoke County in round one of Smart Scale. The original cost was 1.9 million and it was fully funded with district grant funds. The original scope inc included converting an existing signalized intersection to a roundabout, as well as some access management, paved shoulders, and a pedestrian crossing. The project is VDOT administered. Uh, the current estimate has increased to $3.7 million, which represents a $1.8 million shortfall. This project is scheduled to go to ADD in August of 2021 and currently we've spent about $540,000 on the project. Next slide. This is just a sketch of the project location. I will point out on this slide, you can see that Route 311 is a bit of a parallel facility to I-81, um, which is part of what's driving the cost increase. Next slide. So some of the major factors that are contributing to the funding shortfall 
I include uh, just an underestimation of initial quantities for major items, including paving and drainage in the original application. Uh, also, the original application included unit prices from 2015, which are not at all in line with current costs we're seeing on uh, urban projects. Um, also, this, the location of this project is in a very tight area where it's a very steep grade on one side, as well as a, a creek with an, an adjacent structure that really limit the, um, the area for the contractor to work in. And then finally, um, the, the route itself is somewhat parallel to I-81 and often provides a detour route. Uh, and there are active, uh, there will be active construction zones on I-81 um, in this vicinity. And so there was some um, potential risk uh, for the contractor. The district has worked to reduce the cost of the project by um, minimizing the length of the tie-ins and connections they're also um, using the existing pavement to the uh, extent possible. They've also uh, re-looked at the drainage plan and optimized their, uh, their plan for that, as well as eliminating some non-essential curb and gutter. Uh, they've also worked uh, to develop some maintenance of traffic concepts to provide some additional space for the contractor. Next slide. This slide just shows the project as in a snapshot Again, the original application had a $2 million cost. The current estimate is about $3.8 million uh, for an increase of $1.8 million. And the original project score was 5.84. Uh, the current score based on the revised cost is 3.03. .03. The project uh, dropped from 12 out of 20 selected projects in round one to 13, and it would have still been funded. Most of the project score came from uh, safety and economic development. Next slide. The Salem District does have sufficient funds, uh, surplus funds from other projects to cover this shortfall. Uh, and so I'll be bringing to you a, uh, an action item in June um, with a recommendation to approve this budget increase so that the project continue, can continue to advance to advertisement. So before I go to the Lynchburg project, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the Salem project. Mr. Smith. Uh, Madam Secretary, I have discussed this with the district engineer. I think we would all agree that uh, the uh, estimating process now uh, seven years ago left something to be desired but it is a project that still uh, at the new cost would uh, be included, uh, met the criteria, and the difference can be uh, funded from district grant funds. So I hope that uh, we would agree to proceed with the project when it comes before us next month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smoot. Anybody else? Okay, Ms. Pryor. All right, next slide, please. The next project is in the Lynchburg district. It's at Route 29 and Route 6. Uh, it's an intersection improvement. This project was submitted by Nelson County in Round 3 of Smart Scale. Uh, the total original project cost was $2.7 million, and it was fully funded with district grant funds. The project is VDOT administered. Uh, preliminary engineering has been underway, and about $20,000 has been spent to date. The original scope of the project including re included reconstruction of the intersection um, as an R cut or a restricted crossing um, intersection. Next slide. This is a snapshot of the project details. Again, $2.7 million cost. Uh, the cost has not changed um, since the application. It had a score of 7.15. Uh, it ranked five out of eight. And again, we've spent about a little over $20,000. Um, most of the project score um, came from safety. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of the project location and the proposed improvement. Next slide. After this project was submitted uh, in round three, in an attempt to address uh, the existing safety issues, uh, the district moved forward with a safety project funded with HSIP dollars in 2018. They installed some traffic actuated flashing beacons 
they improved the pavement markings and also installed some signage improvements. Uh, since completion of that project, there's been a significant um, improvement uh, in the safety issues. There's been a significant decrease in accidents. Um, total crashes and angle crashes have been reduced by about 50%. Um, as a result, um, Nelson County passed a resolution requesting the cancellation of this project um, back in April with the, um, the recommendation that the existing treatments have been a, a low cost um, and effective solution for the project, for the safety issues at the intersection. Uh, this will be brought back to you next month with a recommendation to cancel this project and transfer the remaining district grant funds back to the district balance entry. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on this proposed cancellation. Mr. Dodson. Yeah, Madam Secretary, good morning, everyone. Uh, this issue has been fully vetted by our people in the Lynchburg District. Um, uh, it's great that they uh, took the initiative as far as safety in relation uh, to reducing the accidents, so I have to spend the money uh, at this time. Uh, there is another project that Nelson County uh, Board of Supervisors has uh, supported uh, right on Route 29, uh, and I've, uh, it's been recommended in the Route 4 um deliberations as far as approval so i would strongly suggest i'm glad when we spent twenty one thousand dollars before this project was uh, uh potentially discontinued but it's it's a, it's a good it's a good way of, of saving money and put it on another project will help it'll help uh, the safety of uh, route 29 so i suggest we um go ahead and approve it tomorrow thank you excellent any other questions or comments Okay, um, Ms. Pryor, is this on vote for tomorrow or June? June. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 just, just making sure. It does happen. <laughs> We're trying not to, but um, it does happen. So anyway, no, what a smart decision. So thank you very much. All right, Ms. Pryor. Thank you. Again. Okay, Mr. Lawson and Mr. Minnell. Hey, good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. Yeah, it was an afternoon, almost. I have 11.59. Oh, I got 12.04, so it's somewhere in, in, in that <laughs> ballpark. Let's say. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Secretary. I, I want to just start with a few opening comments this morning, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ben. Um, and just to recap, you know, last month I provided an overview of the interstate operations and uh, enhancement program and the prioritization process that's being developed um, to, to manage that program. And just as a reminder, you know, the purpose of this program is to improve the safety, reliability, and traffic flow along interstate highways, corridors, and the Commonwealth. You know, this program uh, came about through the, the, the 2019 interstate legislation, um, Senate Bill 1716 and House Bill 2718, and then it was further defined in the omnibus legislation in 2020, which is codified in, in uh, Section 332372. Um, this program is it, just as a reminder again, is funded by 20% of the funds available for construction after the revenue sharing um, takedown. Um, since the last CTV meeting, um, we have worked with VDOT to develop the prioritization process and policy for this program. Um, you should have seen or gotten a draft of that in your, in your materials. And I'm now going to turn to Ben Manel and let him walk you through the process. Ben? All right. Thank you, John. And thank you, Madam Secretary and members of the board. <clears throat> uh, Carol, if you could advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is just a, a recap of what John just covered uh, and was covered at last month's workshop. Uh, the IOEP is now codified and it has that defined goal of improving safety, reliability, and travel flow along the interstate. There are certain requirements. Uh, the funds can be used to address VTRANS needs or needs identified in interstate corridor plans that have been adopted by the CTB. And a prior process for the distribution of those interstate operations and enhancement program funds must be put in place with a first priority given to operational improvements and transportation demand management. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another recap slide. 
uh, from last month. It's important to note that <clears throat> over 50% of the funding is directed to the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority and the I-81 Corridor Improvement Fund. And that funding is not subject to the requirements uh, that were just outlined on that previous slide. The remaining funds are split between the two interstate corridors, and that's I-95 and I-64, that have over 10% of their <clears throat> vehicle miles traveled comprised of FHWA Class 6 vehicles or higher, and those are essentially trucks. The remaining funding uh, can be used on any interstate at the board's discretion. Next slide, please. This table shows the current IOEP funding distribution. And as you can see, there's almost 1.2 billion in dedicated funding over the six year life of the program. Next slide, please. This table shows the IOEP funding that is available for allocation on I-95, I-64 and the remaining interstates. This reflects previously programmed funding commitments to the I-95 operations improvements that occurred in January of 2020 and the I-64, 664 operations improvements amendment to the program that occurred in January of 2021. Next slide, please. Now, with respect to development of a CTB policy to enshrine the methodology we would apply to the IOEP, we wanted to start with the quarter improvement plan process and wanted to say up front that our intent is to develop formal quarter improvement plans or CIPs for each corridor with dedicated funding. And that would be I-81, I-95, and I-64. And as you can see, uh, these would be targeted plans that focus on top 25% locations for congestion, safety, and reliability. They'd be performance-driven, uh, developing operational strategies using a return on investment methodology, where we focus on implementing operational improvements that have BCA uh, greater than one, and also right-sizing of solutions where we develop transportation demand management strategies and capital improvements for top problem areas, again, using a smart scale-like methodology. We would also be looking to analyze conditions on other interstate corridors uh, using that same methodology and then comparing those needs across all the interstate corridors. And in each case, we're going to be making sure that the recommendations are meeting a VTRANS need or are aligning with uh, something that's been identified as a need in our corridor improvement plan. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to cover the prioritization process that we are recommending for application. So to meet the code requirements, we are addressing operation projects first and are prioritizing them using that ROI methodology, where we look to advance projects tied to the top 25% performance location. Next, we're gonna be addressing transportation demand management, which includes bus, rail, and park and ride. And finally, we move to the highway capital improvement projects. For the transportation demand management and highway capital projects, we are again going to be using that smart scale like process. And for the prioritization weights, we are recommending use of the same weights that were applied in the IE1 corridor improvement plan and expanding their application to all the interstates. And we feel that those measures and weights align with the codified goal of improving the safety, reliability, and travel flow of the interstates. And it's important to note that the measures that we are proposing to use, person hours of delay reduction, reduction of fatal and severe injury crashes, and accessibility to jobs, are the same uh, measures that are being used in smart scale. They do not reflect all of the measures used from smart scale. And that came about when we looked at uh, the application of measures for prioritization on 81, uh, we evaluated looking at a whole host of potential measures and weights and these are really the ones that provided the greatest differentiation and allowed us to prioritize the interstate segments. Following the initial prioritization, we plan on going through an exercise similar to the one we conducted for I-81, and we, where we looked at constructability and risk issues associated with specific project recommendations and used that information to develop schedules in a program. And at that point, we would need to escalate the project costs based on their year of expenditure in that scheduled program. 
Next slide, please. Following the prioritization, we move to developing the funding scenario. And as I mentioned previously, the first step is to fund operations improvements and their initial O&M costs on all interstates from the respective dedicated funding streams. Step two is very similar to the district grant funding step in smart scale. And in this case, we're gonna be prioritizing the dedicated funding for the I-95 and I-64 corridors first. Uh, this is done independently and dedicated funding from each one of those corridors is applied in order of priority until the remaining funds are insufficient to fund the next ranked project. Any remaining funding is set aside. Step three is very similar to the high priority funding step in smart scale. Here we will be combining the remaining unfunded priorities from the 95 and 64 corridors along with other interstate recommendations and funding those with any remaining dedicated funds from 95 and 64, as well as then moving into the other interstate funding category until the remaining funds are insufficient to fund the next ranked project. And again, sitting, setting aside the remaining balance. There will in all likelihood be some remaining unallocated funding following those initial three steps. And at that point, the CTB may adjust the funding scenario to allocate those remaining balances. Next slide, please. Now on the previous funding scenario slide, I did mention the funding of operating projects, O&M costs. There was some discussion on that item last month when Mr. Lawson introduced the concept. And I wanted to follow up and provide some additional uh, recommendations on our part. And our recommendation is to fund the ongoing operations and maintenance costs for those operational improvements through FY 2027. We believe this will allow the Highway Maintenance and Operations Fund revenues to recover. And at that point, the O&M costs can be absorbed by the HMOF. We are recommending funding not only the implementation of transit, which involves capital uh, for the upfront cost of implementing, but also the initial three years of transit operating costs. And this is similar to what we do with federal funding, that, uh, similar to CMAC funding. At that point, we believe that the operating costs will be able to be absorbed by the transit providers. Though as part of the policy that we are proposing, we did want to allow the board the discretion to provide additional operating assistance for up to three additional years on high performing routes should no other funding become available. Following the initial tranche of projects that we would be putting forward to you uh, in August and in subsequent quarter improvement plans, we would bring the highway operations projects O&M costs and transit operating costs into line and fund each for a period of three years. Next slide, please. Also, as part of the draft IOEP policy, we are recommending an approach on specific instances where we may be considering the expansion of the interstate with additional lanes. Our recommendation is that if new general purpose lanes are expected to remain or become congested again within 20 years, the implementation of multimodal options or express lanes should be given priority over general purpose lanes. And we feel this addresses concerns that we have with ensuring a reliable travel option on interstates that have a high demand, as well as ensuring we are supporting carpooling and transit options that focus on the movement of people. Next slide, please. Finally, as part of the policy, we'd like to establish an update cycle for the interstate quarter improvement plans, where they would be updated at least every four years to support updates to the IOEP program. And this aligns with the update cycle for VTRANS. It also aligns with the typical duration of an administration. And we also wanted to expressly assure that any actions requiring federal approvals, and this really applies to just about any action related to the interstate system, must flow through VDOT to FHWA as the department's entrusted with ensuring the safety and ongoing operations and maintenance of the interstate. Next slide. Now I'm going to shift gears here very quickly and provide a quick status of where we stand with both the 95 and 64 corridor improvement plans. 
Next slide. So for both of those plans, uh, performance issues have been identified and validated through public engagement. Operations improvements have been identified and prioritized based on that return on investment analysis, and they have been programmed. Targeted transportation demand management and highway capital solutions have been identified and presented to the public, and we are in the midst of a smart scale-like evaluation of that transportation demand management and capital improvement. Next slide. The interstate corridor improvement plans will report out and document the following areas, existing conditions, performance measures, development of target improvements, cost estimating, smart scale, and return on investment analyses, project prioritization, and projects recommended for further study, as well as next steps that are recommended on each corridor. Next slide, please. So just a recap of what was done for the 95 corridor improvement plan. Uh, the study area was expanded from the original joint resolution legislation uh, to cover the entire corridor in Virginia. It is an extremely multimodal corridor with a prevalence of modes increasing as you travel towards the DC region. Uh, we have held significant public involvement at each phase of this plan development. It culminated with the adoption of an interim plan by the board in January of 2020. Next slide, please. And before we dive into improvement highlights on the 95 quarter, I did want to acknowledge some activities and changes that have been underway since January of 2020 when that interim plan was adopted that impact the study and its recommendations. We have made significant progress on locations identified for further study. Now, these include studies in the 9564 overlap in downtown Richmond. And there has also been progress made on advancing the variable speed limit recommendations south of Fredericksburg. Um, this was an operational improvement that was identified in the 95 interim plan. We are also working to make adjustments to the plan based on transforming rail in Virginia. Now, that is a separate initiative with funding, but the outcomes from that initiative impact several recommendations that we had identified on the 95 corridor, particularly additional VRE service during the peak period. That service is well on its way to becoming reality. So we are going to be removing those from consideration at this time. We've also been working closely with the Department of Rail and Public Transportation and the transit providers on the corridor to make adjustments to the initial commuter and express bus recommendations uh, based on travel patterns that have changed as a result of the pandemic. And finally, we have reached out at reached a point on the exit 160 study, which is the 95-123 interchange, which if you recall was one of the major bottlenecks along the corridor. And we are gonna be able to consider improvements at that location as part of our prioritization process. Next slide, please. So I did wanna provide a brief overview of some of the highlights of the multimodal recommendations along the 95 corridor. Again, it includes expanded commuter and express bus service between Fredericksburg and DC, enhancement and expansion of several park and ride lots, as well as some new park and ride lots. Next slide. And as I mentioned previously, we do have a recommendation at the 95-123 interchange. Uh, we would be looking to reconfigure the ramps to eliminate a merge where we have a lane drop in the middle of that interchange uh, that should dramatically improve safety and traffic flow at that location. Next slide. Uh, this is an interchange reconfiguration at the Route 10 interchange down in Chesterfield County along the 95 corridor, as well as a new park and ride lot uh, that was one of the recommendations that was included in the package. Next slide, please. Now I wanted to shift over to the 64 corridor. We initiated this study in December of 2019 with the intention to bring the 64 corridor up to a commensurate level of study with the 95 corridor, as those two corridors serve a majority of the Commonwealth's population. And during the study period, the Interstate Operations and Enhancement Program was actually codified in the omnibus bill in 2020. 64 and 95 corridors were identified for dedicated funding uh, which only added to the importance of completing the quarter plan for the I-64 quarter. We held virtual public meetings uh, that followed a similar format to both the 95 and 81 
uh, quarter improvement plan meetings, and we identified operational improvements, and those were again amended into the program uh, this January. We are currently working on smart scale life scoring of the potential solution. Next slide, please. So similar to 95, I wanted to highlight some of the multimodal recommendations. Uh, in this case, they're in the Richmond and Hampton Roads regions. Uh, we had new service recommended in Richmond with a short front express route, as well as increasing service on routes in both uh, Richmond and Hampton Roads areas, and several new park and ride lines. Next slide. And this is just an example graphic, but it shows you the, the routes that were under consideration uh, for expansion down at Hampton Roads. Some of those went across the HRPT, others uh, provided service on the peninsula. Next slide, please. We also considered widening on I-64 on the peninsula between the Richmond and Williamsburg area with uh, the addition of one lane in each direction. Next slide, please. And we looked at modifications to interchanges, and this is an example of the Perham Road interchange in the west end of Richmond. Uh, this will be improving safety and reducing the potential for queues uh, from the ramps backing up onto the main line. Next slide. And we also looked at auxiliary lanes. Uh, this is an example of an eastbound auxiliary lane in the Hampton Roads area, and this is, happens to be between the LaSalle Avenue on-ramp and the rip rep road off ramp. Uh, the safety improvement that will help with the merge and verge that occurs at that location. Next slide. And this is an example of another major interchange improvement. This is the 64 464 interchange exit 291. Uh, I think you've heard about this uh, location before, but this essentially bifurcates the traffic from the inner loop to Dominion Boulevard and Route 168 southbound, and it's anticipated to be one of the remaining bottlenecks following the implementation of the Hampton Roads Express Lanes Network. Next slide. And finally, we did look at the remaining interstate corridors, and we have worked to identify a slate of recommended operational improvements on each using the same uh, return on investment analysis that we employed on 95 and 64 corridors. We have also identified potential improvements on those corridors as well, capital improvements on those corridors as well. Next slide. So in terms of next steps, uh, we have provided you with a draft resolution uh, on the IOEP policy. And right now that is in line with the content that I've shared with you today. Uh, we can make adjustments based on any feedback that you provide and would like to bring that back to you at the June meeting for potential adoption. And in July, we would like to come back to share draft versions of both the 95 and 64 corridor improvement plans, as well as an initial staff recommended funding scenario for your consideration, and follow that up in August, uh, looking to adopt the final 95 and 64 corridor improvement plan documents, as well as a final uh, funding scenario. That concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, John Laudis Lawson, for your leadership on this as well. Uh, I will say that um, I'm sure some of you are looking at the slide thinking August. Um, we may have a call in August. There are a few items we may need to have a vote. I anticipate that it would be a quick meeting. Um, but it would also, uh, as I'm thinking ahead, allow us to look at the reforecast of the budget, which from earlier discussions today may be of interest to everybody. <laughs> so um, that is tentative right now, but right now we are anticipating a very brief virtual meeting, um, possibly in August. So with that, um, does anyone have any questions or comments uh, for Ben Minnell or John? Madam Secretary, this is Shep. Hey, Mr. Miller. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Minnell, you, you spoke about the, uh, including in the policy, funding the um, O&M for these projects for the next six years for the, for the interstate projects. Um, 
what kind of percent of the total money is that? And how do you distinguish when you make an improvement um, to a stretch of interstate, what's O&M for the improvement versus what's already there? Because I don't think you can do it. I think the legislation prevents you from using the money for what's already there, O&M. Is that correct? So as a point of clarification, the O&M that we are discussing carrying forward is related solely to the operational improvement uh, that would be recommended, not the capital. Okay, so um, give me an example. Then, so uh, potentially safety service patrol or uh, the trip towing program or the towing incentive program, those would be examples of operational improvements that would be recommended, implemented, funded initially with this uh, this funding from the IOEP, but we are proposing to uh, fund their ongoing operations and maintenance for the six-year improvement program with them. And so what kind of uh, money are you talking about as a percent of the total funds? So, for the 95 quarter, it's going to vary by corridor, but for the 95 quarter, we're we talking about uh, 25 to 30 percent of the overall funding available in the six year window. In the 64 quarter, the types of operational improvements that have been recommended are uh, much less OM intensive. Their recommendations are along the lines of probably about 5 percent of the overall total and five or less percent for the remainder of the other interstates as well. All right, thank you. Appreciate it, good presentation. Um, yeah, Mr. Miller, Thanks, just sir. to, to yes, follow sir. up on that, um, in, in the, the slide deck from, from last month, um, I, I showed a slide of, what the, of, of the operational improvements and when, in looking at these, the annual cost you know, is about 9 million a year for 95, it's um, about a million dollars a year on 64 and about just over a million for the other interstate. So it's about $11 million collectively. So it's not a big, a big impact to the, to the rest of the budget. It's there, but it's, and I, and I endorse it. I think it's the right way to go, but um, I was just wondering what the impact was. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Madam Secretary, this is Mark Merrill. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you. On slide, excuse me, on slide 25, you referenced that the other interstate corridors outside of 95 and 64 have been studied and the operational improvements and capital improvements have been identified. When will you be able to share what those look like? I have particular interest, obviously, in, in 80, 81, and as well as, you know, 85, et cetera. So the, just a to clarify, the 81 corridor, we are not recommending anything on that at this point in time since it already has its dedicated corridor improvement funds and program that has been adopted. Uh, for the remaining corridors, it's our intention to get you the draft list of recommendations at the June meeting. Um, Mr. Merrill, I will just point out that along the I-81, um, because we had developed that improvement program in 2018 and then took that to the General Assembly, that program was already in place. And the very first um, investments we made were the operational improvements along the corner. So with safety service patrols, signage. Right. Um, uh, so that has already been, so now we're on the capital program and we're really structuring it to do the operational improvement first because they give us such a, um, a strong bang for our buck and we can implement them very quickly. So Thank you. Commissioner Bridge had 81 operational improvements out the door, I think July 1, as soon as, as, soon as the legislation had passed. Yes, I, yes, we did, Madam Secretary. So yes, people were excited. I will point out that um, I think it's just worth <laughs> pausing for a moment that, you know, we did the study in 2018. We introduced the legislation with potential funding in the 2019 session. The legislation passed, the funding did not. And then between the end of the session 
and the reconvene session on April 3rd, I believe, um, we were able to identify the funding and the program really went from being only I-81 to an interstate program. So I continue to be thankful to Governor Northam, legislators bipartisan along the quarter, um, so many businesses and citizens who refused to give up and the trucking industry who really came to the table and worked with us. And so I always thank um, Dale Bennett and Ward Best for collaborating with us to come up with the funding for this. <clears throat> and here we are today. Okay, anybody else? Madam okay. Secretary, this is Allison. I recall at our last meeting there was um, a discussion about the uh, widening of Afton Mountain for the 64, uh, along the 64 corridor. Where does that fit into this? Mr. Manel? Yes, ma'am. So that was one of the recommendations that is included in the, or will be included in the prioritization process as we move forward. Uh, I would like to note also that there is a congestion management system that is advancing on the Afton Mountain uh, on 64. Uh, that was a result of a study. So that's gonna be an operational improvement that's gonna be advancing here very soon. Okay. But all of this needs to go through the prioritization process that Ben just laid out today. Okay. So we have to adopt this. We're going to adopt it in June. And then the, I, the um, capital improvements that were identified as we were doing the study, they will go through that prioritization process. And then we'll know what we're able to fund. Thank you. And can I say, Mr. Manel, I knew you were going to get that question. <laughs> yes, you did. And said, Ben, you better be prepared because Mr. Tonks is going to ask it. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, um, Mr. Manel, Mr. Lawson, thank you. And thank you. with that, um, I'm going to, because our meeting ends at one, and I believe we can um, get through Mr. Pittard's presentation. Right, thank Mr. You, Pittard? How are you? Thank you very much. Um, and I will be brief. Um, so members of the board, um, today I just wanted to provide a brief update on the passenger rail authority um, budget for fiscal year 22. Um, next slide, please. So y'all may recall um, I presented to you back in December and that was uh, to talk about a format uh, for the budget for the passenger rail authority to get your feedback. Um, then we finished the development of the budget, um, submitted uh, to you on February 1st, as required uh, in the legislation, uh, the recommended budget. Uh, then February 17th, I presented uh, a detailed presentation of the actual budget for Passenger Rail Authority and received some feedback at that time. Um, we also uh, last month came to you and did a uh, station policy and needs assessment presentation and got some further feedback that had some uh, relevance uh, to our budget uh, for FY22. So we, in the May 14th, we held a finance committee meeting uh, for the Passenger Rail Authority Board. And at that meeting, we did recommend uh, some amendments to the budget uh, that we're seeking your approval from tomorrow um, at the action items. And then that approval will be conditional that the Passenger Rail Authority Board will give their approval of the amendment um, at their May 24th board meeting. Next slide, please. So with that, what we are recommending is uh, based on feedback from um, the board, you, know, you as a board, also um, we, completed the purchase of the first segment uh, from CSX, as you may know, in um, the middle of April, April 14th, we closed on that um, and we took ownership of uh, ownership interest in some of the stations. And as a result of that, uh, we also had some Americans with Disabilities Act uh, needs that 
all of a sudden became our requirements um, rather than um, I think Amtrak and had the, the requirements before that. And so based on that, your feedback, and also there was a stipulation in the final Amtrak agreement for that large funding commitment they've made to the I-95 corridor initiative under TRV. Um, there was a, they wanted a stipulation of a maintenance reserve um, in case of $5 million, in case there was an accident they wanted some funds reserved to allow for the improvements to get service back up and run. And that amount was $5 million. So that's what we're recommending is to add uh, a seven and a half million dollars for the ADA uh, needs, uh, add, a, add $5 million for that Amtrak maintenance reserve, and then add a million and a half dollars for state of good repair needs. And I think, um, the last line here just shows you the line we're adding it into the budget. But I think the main point I want to make too is, as evidenced by the presentation provided to y'all last month uh, on station needs, uh, as well as the station policy that DRPT and Passenger Rail Authority are working together on, we are this this process is ongoing as far as the final needs that uh, will be required for the stations that uh, we're taking ownership on within the Commonwealth. So over the coming months, in conjunction with one, we're going to start the budget development for FY23, and then also <laughs> working with uh, the policy group at DRPT, we're going to be re further refining these numbers. Next slide, please. So this slide is really just showing you uh, the detail by year um, to the actual line items that we're going to be adjusting in the budget for this proposed amendment. Um, and as I just said, uh, it, well, I'll say this, it is a fairly significant increase over the original uh, 7.1 million. We're adding an additional $9 million. And as I just finished saying, we're continuing to refine uh, these numbers uh, in the upcoming budget process. Next slide, please. And this next slide uh, just shows the impact to the overall capital grants budget for the six year window, plus the pro forma for FY21. So it's showing it going from a 401 million capital grants budget to a $415 million for capital grants budget. And finally, the last slide I have for y'all today is really just for informational purposes. This is the code language uh, in the in the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority section of the code related to the budget. And uh, as you see, as I mentioned earlier, the February 1 deadline to submit to the board. And then you have a May 30th uh, timeline to approve the capital budget uh, portion the document. And with that, I uh, believe that's on my last slide. I'm uh, glad to entertain any questions you may have. I'm going to try Jennifer Mitchell one more time. <laughs> there she is. Yes, I'm here. I switched. I, I, I know. I was reading your text, but glad, oh, glad you finally arrived. <laughs> What did I miss? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I um, I have been here the whole time. Um, I just want to reiterate what um, Steve mentioned about the proposed additions to the budget that, um, you know, these are based on some of the conversations that we had with um, you all in prior meetings, uh, particularly in making sure that we have adequately funded uh, state of good repair needs for stations. Um, and as we discussed in our stations presentation with you all, DRPT will still be looking at um, other station needs as part of the statewide rail plan, um, but we did want to make sure we have some funding allocated in the um, VPRA budget that would be approved this um, or um, that would go into effect for the next fiscal year um, to make sure that we did have some funding available for those, especially those ADA compliance needs, which we have now taken on as the owner of these stations, which really needs to be our top priority at the moment. Um, so with this, it would be a conditional, uh, we would be seeking a conditional approval from you all and asking the VPRA board to formally adopt these changes at the board's next meeting, which I believe is on June 28th. So that's all I've got. I'm happy to yeah, answer any questions that you may have for either me or Steve. 
So any questions or comments from the board? Madam Secretary, this is Greg. Hello again. Hello again. Um, if, if we could go back to the slide with the, uh, the additions to the budget, I'd like to see that in front of me. And then I have questions uh, for both of you. Um, I know, for instance, if we, we're, you know, increasing capacity on all these lines, and in particular, um, small station like Culpeper, they have already added uh, real estate and the town has bought property to add a much larger parking lot <coughs> uh, in anticipation of much increased traffic at that station. So would the state of good repair increase? I don't see that slide up yet, but anyway, would the state of good repair in, uh, money help with funding uh, improvements to that parking lot or does that need to be under another capital uh, item and, and you know, or where, where can they get some money from you guys if, if they need to apply for some to increase capacity there? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in Jennifer and you're welcome to jump in also. So, Mr. Yates, what you described to me sounds more like a, uh, a new capital item as opposed to right. Um, right. state of good repair, which is what we're dealing with here. Um, and the VPRA, it, as you, you heard, we do have a capital grants um, section of our budget. Um, and really, in this inaugural year, what that is, is we inherited uh, a lot of capital grants from the prior rail programs that DRPT managed. And so there really was not an opportunity um, this year to you know, develop a process for applying for funding. Um, and so to answer your question, I think that would be something going forward that the passenger rail authority will be looking to, to possibly developing a capital grants type of application process similar to what uh, used to exist under the IPROC fund or the rail enhancement fund. Um, but in this current year of development and stand up, uh, that just did not exist. I understand that. I just think you everybody should be aware that not only the small stations like Culpeper, but the other stations, when this capacity gets increased, which it will post COVID and, and adding all these extra lines we're buying, um, we're going to need some more money in the, in the budget for, for things like the capital grants program. So I really hate to see that get pushed down the road, but is that something that'll be, you know, once you develop this long-term budget, sometimes it's hard to add things in. So is that something that will be put back in at some point or applied for? I, I think um, there is, there will be an opportunity in the future for the VPRA board to um, consider that we can certainly have that be part of our um, budget development process for next year when the board will be discussing priorities and um, all the different um, funding needs that we have out there. Um, we certainly are very well aware that we need to have some sort of ability to fund a capacity expansion projects, as, especially as we're entering into agreements to add new service. Um, right. Our priority right now, though, is really trying to make sure that we have those ADA compliance needs fully addressed because um, there is some um, there are legal requirements that you know require the VPRA now to be able to address those needs in a certain time frame and so that's that's why we really wanted to make sure we have those identified and and funding set aside for those but the VPRA will be beginning their budget development process over the summer um, and there certainly may be an opportunity there to talk about any additional funding that could be available for some of those um, station capacity needs. So. Jennifer, remind me, will the station um, policy reside with VPRA or DRPT? DRPT is gonna set the station policy as a part of its statewide rail plan. And as part of that would lay out a framework, a recommended framework for some of the priorities um, for station needs going forward. It will be the VPRA's as uh, because the funding will be going through VPRA, um, they would be the ones to make the actual decision and the um, like, like CTB does in the six year plan to make those funding allocation decisions. Um, but my, the point I'm states. just trying to get to, Mr. Yates, is the recommendation for the station policy going through DRPT, we can still have input into. It's going to be part of the statewide rail plan. So I think Mr. Yates's point, and I and Allison Detonk has raised this before, as well as others, 
making sure that we're addressing that. And so right. with DRPT and then determining how we're going to fund it. So they come right. for me, they go hand in hand. Right. Okay. So where, where this needs to be developed is with DRPT and the statewide rail plan. So, Mr. Yates, uh, I will make uh, sure uh, your Dr. concern um, is addressed there. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you, Jennifer and Steve. I really appreciate that. Madam Secretary. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Um, I appreciate Greg's comments. I, I think he is on target. I also appreciate the attention that has been given to the maintenance matter and, and resulting in bringing forward the budget amendments. Let me just say, and, and there are perhaps some other members of CTB who are interested in this, and, and perhaps some who are not. I, I would like to have a, a conversation at some point uh, and with other members who are interested about stations. You know, the, the, the station situation is, is sort of uh, fuzzy at best to me, but there's at least one that is privately owned. Uh, there are some that are owned by local governments. Uh, there are some that serve VRE. Uh, there's at least one place that has a stop that doesn't have a station. Um, and, and, you know, thinking about the future and recognizing that stations are the gates to a community. And for some travelers, they are the initial gate to the Commonwealth. Uh, we need to have a plan in place that assures that we are addressing to the extent that the state is going to take financial responsibility and that localities are addressing to the extent they're going to take financial responsibility, uh, these stations and that it's done in an equitable manner around, mm -hmm. the, around the Commonwealth. So, uh, I, I, I would be interested in having that conversation and perhaps others would be too, but, um, it, it is an important subject going forward. Yes, yeah. you know, Mr. Smoot, do you want to just share with the board the legislation that um, Senator Edwards and Delegate Hearst introduced for your region? Surely, and, and just briefly, uh, the, the legislature did approve requested legislation to establish a New River Valley Passenger Rail Authority, which would have, uh, as its, at least its primary uh, business, First, the construction of a station in the New River Valley, and then the ongoing operation of a station in the New River Valley. Uh, we have about 10 local governments, uh, and, and including two universities, that have expressed an interest in belonging to this authority. They recognize that it's going to cost something on an annual basis to, uh, to do this. Uh, they also recognize they need a clear understanding of what the Commonwealth's role is going to be in station, uh, in funding station construction and maintenance, as well as the local responsibility for that as they work through this process. But uh, we are ready to proceed, and uh, that is going to occur over the next six months as we prepare for the extension of passenger rail to the New River Valley. Yes. And, and, and I think, you know, importantly, as we develop the statewide rail plan, you know, keeping in mind the partnerships that can help us um, develop this as well. Um, so, you know, Jennifer, I just think there's so many opportunities um, for us to develop this plan. I'm going to give a lot of credit to um, Director Mitchell, though, for a moment, because when I came on to the CTB, um, I think it was 2014, and I was a member of the rail committee, there was no station policy at all. And so really, Jennifer has kind of helped guide us um, with a station policy. And now, as we're making these investments, and it truly is transforming, um, a statewide rail plan, this is really the right time to um, uh, really uh, make some deliberate decisions about this. Yeah. And, and, and thank you. And and if I may as well, um, Mr. Smith, we, we did develop after our last May meeting, 
Um, we have a, ma a master matrix that we've put together with all of the stations across the state, um, and which will I will um, make sure all of you get it. It is okay. it is different at every single station. Yes. And, and a lot of that is just how these stations evolved historically um, and how ownership patterns changed. And um, so it's really difficult to apply a single um, methodology or framework to all of the stations across the state because they're completely they are, they're all very different depending on you know you may have a city that owns the station building but you know the railroad owns the platform and somebody else owns the parking um and so it, there's a lot of different um patterns but certainly i'll share that with you and um i hear we may be having a rail subcommittee meeting soon um again yes yes and we in june all the up, subcommittees uh, are coming back yep great uh, so, yeah, I'd love to see that too, Jennifer. If you can share that with the, the board, even though I'm not a rail subcommittee, I'd like to be on top informed of that. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there, you know, again, I think there's just going to be many opportunity, uh, opportunities for us to really develop a station plan. Um, even though they're all different, you know, how are we going to be making these decisions? So, um, job security for somebody, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, 1247, unless we go by John Lawson's clock, it may be different, but, um, I, why don't we adjourn for the day and we'll reconvene in the morning. Um, we will, uh, go through smart scale at that time. I'm really hoping I, I had asked earlier, but I know Mr. Brown had to sign off. And so anyway, I'm going to save this, um, that presentation. Hopefully we can all be there tomorrow. We'll go through our reports and then we'll get to the action meeting. So um, I really thank you for this and um, I hope you all have a good afternoon. Unless there's anything else anybody would like to state at this time. Okay, thank there you. we go. Enjoy your day. Bye, everybody. Thank, thank you, you Jennifer. Thank you, Steve.